Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Levin. I'm chair of the Council's General Welfare Committee. Before we begin today, I'd like to send uh, our thoughts over to, uh, to Congressman Scalise and uh, the other uh, victims of the shooting today in Virginia. Our, our uh, thoughts are with them, and uh, we wish them uh, a speedy recovery. Um, today, I would like to thank everyone for coming out uh, for today's hearing on five pieces of legislation uh, related to the work of the Administration for Children's Services. Um, I want to thank my colleagues who are here, uh, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera of the Bronx, Councilmember Annabel Palma of the Bronx, Councilmember Ruben Wills of Queens, and we will also be expecting uh, other members of the community to join us and sponsors of the legislation. Uh, we'll be hearing, uh, as I said, five pieces of legislation today. Intro number 1590, sponsored by Councilmember Cabrera, in relation to training for preventive service employees. Intro number 1598, sponsored by myself, in relation to preventive services surveys. Intro number 1601, sponsored by myself and Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, in relation to child stat meetings. Intro 1607, sponsored by Councilmember Debbie Rose, in relation to requiring the Administration for Children's Services to report more information regarding the caseloads of its frontline workers and child safety conferences. Intro 1609, sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, in relation to requiring the Administration for Children's Services to report annually on the aggregate findings and recommendations of its accountability review panel. Uh, and, um, Um, and uh, those are the pieces of legislation that we'll be hearing today. In October of last year, the committee held an oversight hearing to examine how various system, systems respond to severe allegations of child abuse, including ACS, Department of Education, Department of Homeless Services, and the NYPD after the tragic death of Zymir Perkins. At that hearing, we learned about various new initiatives and reforms that the administration would be taking to improve its services to vulnerable children and families. Then in December, this committee held a subsequent hearing on one of the key components of ACS's child welfare practices, preventive services. The bills we are considering today came out of ideas and concerns raised at those hearings. Last month, at the General Welfare Committee Fiscal 18 Executive Budget Hearing, Commissioner David Hansel testified about several initiatives which cover some of the same topics addressed by the bills that we are being that are being heard today, including the revamp of child stat and training for preventive service workers. I was pleased to hear about those initiatives, and today I hope we can take a deeper dive into the work being done by ACS to improve its child welfare practices. Today we will also be discussing the recent findings of the independent assessment of systemic issues related to child safety that was conducted by the Casey Family Programs at the request of ACS. The report by Casey Family Programs, a national expert in child welfare, included an analysis of ACS's practices, highlighted areas of strength and areas for opportunity. I look forward to hearing from Commissioner Hansel about what ACS thinks of those recommendations and how they are going to be implementing those recommendations and which process they're going to be using to do that. I'd like to thank Commissioner Hansel for the work that he's done in the short time since he's joined ACS and for being forthcoming with this committee. I look forward to our continued work together. Uh, today, unrelated to our primary topic, we will also be hearing a resolution in support of the Home Stability Support Plan. Resolution 1462, which I am sponsoring, is in support of the Assembly, me of Assembly Member Andrew Hevesy's recently proposed statewide rental subsidy aimed, uh, aimed at families and individuals who are eligible for public assistance and who are facing eviction, homelessness, or loss of housing due to domestic violence or hazardous living conditions. The supplement would fill the gap between the current public assistance shelter allowance and 85 percent of the fair market rent as determined by HUD. The passage of HSS into law at the state level would be a huge step forward in addressing the homelessness crisis that we are facing here in New York City. Uh, this committee was originally, here, uh, originally scheduled to hear this resolution at a hearing we are holding on homelessness later this month, but due to conflicts between our schedule and the state legislative session, we moved it up to today. We want to ensure that the support was put forward before the state session ended. 
For anyone here wishing to testify on that resolution, we will start with the ACS portion of the hearing and then later take testimony on the resolution. Before we begin, I would like to thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Andrea Vasquez, Senior Counsel, Tanya Cyrus, Senior Policy Analyst, Dohini Sampura, Unit Head, our new Finance Analyst for ACS, Daniel Krupp, and Stacia Ward, Legal Fellow, for putting this hearing forward. Uh, I would also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and Budget Director, Edward Paulino, for their work in preparing for today's hearing. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over now to um, my colleagues who are uh, sponsoring the legislation that we are hearing today. So I'll first call uh, uh, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, and we've also been joined by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and to committee members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to hear testimony on my bill, Intro 1590. This bill will require ACS to provide training on identifying and reporting suspected physical abuse and neglect to all individuals providing preventive services before the individual begins to provide these services. The bill will further require ACS to ensure that all individuals providing preventive services participate in at least two trainings per year. As you know, preventive services are an important tool for assisting parents, keeping children safe, and keeping families together. Intro 1590 will strengthen this agency's ability to protect children who have been identified as at risk for abuse or neglect and provide intervention to families who might be in crisis. Closing, I want to thank uh, Andrea Vasquez, Senior Legislative Counsel, and the staff for the work on this legislation. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilor Cabrera. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, uh, before you begin your testimony, can I uh, ask anybody that's going to be testifying to raise their right hand, please? Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. And, Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Levin, members of the General Welfare Committee. Um, I, again, I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Um, and with me here today are my colleagues on my right, Andrew White, who is our Deputy Commissioner for Policy Planning and Measurement. And to my left, Jacqueline Martin, who is our Deputy Commissioner for Preventive Services, and William Fletcher, who is our Deputy Commissioner for Child Protection. I am uh, pleased to be back before the Council just a week after you passed the fiscal year 2018 budget. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity to share with you the work that's underway at ACS in protective and preventive services and to discuss the child welfare bills that are on the agenda for the committee today. When I began my service as commissioner, um, as it happens precisely 100 days ago, um, I immediately initiated a top to bottom review of ACS, as I've discussed with the committee uh, in previous testimony, um, and paid specific attention to our protective and our preventive services. As part of my review, I continued and refocused ACS's engagement with Casey Family Programs, a nationally recognized child welfare organization, to complete a comprehensive assessment of ACS's child safety initiatives, its policies, our casework practice, and our decision-making processes. The key findings and recommendations from Casey's review were encapsulated in a report which was released last week and I'd like to take a minute to discuss the findings and recommendations in the report because I think they're highly relevant to the legislation under discussion today. Overall, Casey found that ACS performs well in relation to other large urban child welfare organizations and other child welfare jurisdictions in New York State. Casey determined that ACS has a strong and well-supported child welfare system impressive safety-related practices and initiatives in place. And in our investigative practices, they found that ACS performed well in critical areas, including our home environment and child safety assessments, which benefit from our use of clinical consultants, subject matter experts in substance abuse, domestic violence, and mental health. Casey also found strong protocols in place for collaboration between ACS and other city agencies as well as an impressive commitment to multidisciplinary support for investigations. They found that ACS caseworkers perform well when assessing family environments, assessing the vulnerability, well-being, and needs of children, determining parents' or other caregivers' ability to recognize and provide for children's needs, 
and responding with urgency to any unsafe conditions. And once family needs have been determined, our Child Protective Specialist staff do well in using data to connect families to appropriate services. Casey also recognized that New York City is a national leader in preventive services. Unlike other jurisdictions, ACS excels at both linking families with services and tracking whether families actually engage in them. We're also leading the way in implementing evidence-based preventive models, many of which address trauma in accordance with accepted best practice. And those evidence-based models now comprise about 25% of our preventive services. Casey also noted that child welfare-involved families in New York City have a substantially lower rate of repeat maltreatment, repeat abuse or neglect, within six months as compared with the rest of the state of New York, 9.8% in New York City compared to 13.0% statewide. We've also seen a decline in repeat maltreatment when families are engaged in present preventive services. In addition to acknowledging what we do well, Casey also identified areas of opportunity in which ACS should improve, such as strengthening practice regarding the consideration of prior reports and behavior patterns in our investigations, in timely supervision and managerial follow-up, and in the organization and dissemination of policy guidance to frontline staff. Casey issued a set of 12 recommendations for strengthening our practice all of which I have accepted. Work is already underway to implement many of them, and others will guide our efforts going forward. New investments in the fiscal year 18 budget will support this implementation, as I'll explain shortly. As Casey recognized, and as we in the city acknowledge, safeguarding children cannot be accomplished by one city agency alone, but must be a shared responsibility. They recommended the development of a mayoral, multi-system, citywide response to child safety in partnership with the community. This effort is well underway through the Children's Cabinet and through our work to strengthen our direct partnerships with other city agencies. In just the past three months, for example, we've expanded our collaboration with NYPD in multiple ways, through our revitalized child staff program, through our neighborhood coordination officer partnership, and through our coordinated investigatory work. We have execu executed a new memorandum of understanding with the Department of Homeless Services that builds on our existing practices to enhance coordination between our agencies and our providers and to better support ACS-involved families who are residing in the shelter system. And we've relaunched our citywide safe sleep campaign in partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, focusing particularly in neighborhoods that are disproportionately impacted by sleep-related fatalities. Other key recommendations from Casey are that ACS should closely examine the interaction between CPS staff and our preventive providers and strengthen ACS support for and the capacity of our contracted preventive service providers. In the area of child protection, Casey calls for ACS to look beyond the number of cases a CPS worker is handling in order to understand their actual workload. Although ACS has some of the lowest caseloads among major child welfare jurisdictions nationally, we also know that the caseload metric does not always reveal the full story. By taking into account all of their job-related duties, including making contact with all of the children and family members involved in a case, as well as other collaterals, handling paperwork, going to court, and seeking professional consultations, we can better assess the real impact of our staffing and case management levels. I'll talk more about our work to address this, including an initiative that's funded by the adopted FY18 budget. So I'd like, in, in, in summary, to thank Casey Family Programs for their comprehensive review and assessment, and I look forward to working with the Council and all of our partners on implementing their recommendations. Moving on to the FY18 budget, um, as I also discussed in my budget testimony last month, I have met in my 100 days with hundreds of our frontline ACS staff and with most of our provider partners to gain a deeper understanding of the challenges that our staff and their staff face in their day-to-day -day work. I've received valuable feedback on ways to improve practice and strengthen supports for staff, much of which has already been woven into the reforms and investments in child welfare that we've announced in the past 100 days. Since I became commissioner, I've focused the agency on tightening our safety net for children and families. Thanks to the commitment of Mayor de Blasio and the Council, 
The city's FY18 budget provides ACS with an extraordinary investment of $54.7 million in new funding for child welfare initiatives to help with this effort. Many of these align with Casey's recommendations and with the bills that are the subject of this hearing. Currently, in the preventive area, ACS contracts with 56 organizations to provide a total of 18 different service models of preventive services. Our current capacity of approximately 13,000 slots will expand by fiscal year 2019 to about 16,000. ACS has heard from the provider community that many of the existing funding models do not cover the full cost of delivering quality services and that the salaries and staffing structures are inadequate to retain and support the, provider, the staff that providers need. We share this concern and we appreciate the Council's support in addressing it robustly in the FY18 budget. Building on the City's nonprofit resiliency work, ACS has made a commitment to review and modify the bulk of our preventive budgets. We recognize that those budgets may not always reflect the requirements and complexities of the model that our providers are delivering. And to that end, we're de developing a process to review the budgets of different models of preventive services, including general preventive programs, family treatment and rehabilitation, certain of our evidence-based models, and our beacon programs. The review will focus on our expectations around the cost and quality of services and whether existing budgets need adjustment or additional funding to ensure that there, those requirements can be met. We expect to begin engaging providers in that process in the very near future. The fiscal year 2018 budget allocates $26 million for adjusting funding to our contracted preventive providers where this review determines that an adjustment is necessary. Our review and assessment will also guide our next preventive services RFP, which we expect to release by early 2019. This work is being done in conjunction with the Office of Management and Budget and builds upon Mayor de Blasio's commitments in ACS's fiscal year 18 executive budget that I discussed last month, including $11.2 million to support 147 new conference facilitators for our provider programs who will help implement new case conferencing protocols and an additional $2.45 million that will allow preventive agencies to send staff to require training each year. Turning to protective, as I have said repeatedly since assuming this role, there is nothing more important to our success than making sure we are doing everything possible to support our frontline CPS workers. To that end, we're embarking on a multifaceted effort to address CPS working conditions, to improve morale, and to decrease attrition. To directly address Casey's recommendation that we more fully and appropriately assess workload impacts, we'll be conducting a workload study with funding in the adopted FY18 budget so that we can better understand the key areas of workload strain and develop effective case management and assignment mechanisms that take into account factors that affect the complexity and intensity of a case, such as family size, travel distance, court engagement. We'll work with a vendor to revamp our existing workload model, which is based on a study from nearly 30 years ago. Using internal resources, we are also exploring ways to address staffing needs by restructuring work in our Division of Child Protection borough offices and speeding up CPS hiring. DCP will launch a demonstration program in the Bronx, in one of the Bronx zones, to hire 17 caseworkers who will handle administrative tasks with the goal of allowing CPS to focus more on direct family engagement and higher quality practice. We're also creating a dedicated unit in our human resources office that will expedite the process for new CPS to be hired. And as I announced in the executive budget hearing, we hope that other initiatives, like equipping CPS with tablet devices and providing other technology-based tools, will promote productivity and alleviate workload stress. Training and professional development are essential components for ensuring that our staff are well equipped on day one in the field and have the most effective tools and skills to effectively engage families and protect children. To that end, we're allocating $3.8 million to partner with CUNY to redesign our initial trainings for newly hired CPS and supervisors. The new curriculum will provide for more real life experiential learning, coaching supports and on the job training as well as individualized assessments. 
We also recognize the need to better assist our CPS with the transition from the training academy into the field office. The adopted FY18 budget provides an additional $900,000 to hire 10 staff development coordinators, one for each of our borough offices, who will help identify staff development needs and will coordinate between the borough offices and the Workforce Institute to help ensure that fundamental training is carried forward into practice and that specialized training on issues like domestic violence and mental health is developed as needed. There are few positions in public service as unique, as demanding, and as rewarding as those of our CPS workers. They truly are our city's unsung heroes, our child safety first responders, and we want to help the public to understand that. The FY18 adopted budget allocates funding for a new campaign to increase public and professional recognition of CPS workers and to recruit new CPS. We'll also do more to honor our CPS workers internally through staff appreciation activities that acknowledge their contributions. To support the well-being of frontline staff who handle particularly difficult or stressful cases, we've executed an agreement with the Office of Labor Relations for additional counselors for the Employee Assistance Program to specifically support our child protection workers. We're proud to partner with EAP, a lifeline for city employees, which will organize and offer programs that address exposure to trauma, coping with challenges, and building resistance in the work, resilience in the work. These important investments and initiatives would not be possible without the mayor's commitment and the council's support through the budget process, and I'm deeply appreciative. I look forward to updating you on the implementation of these initiatives and the, project, the progress that we achieve in the coming months and years. So I hope that I've demonstrated that through our recent budgetary and programmatic initiatives, we are moving forward in the areas of greatest concern to the Council, as embodied in the legislation that is the specific subject of this hearing. I believe we share the same goals and spirit as the Council in this area, but we do have significant concerns about the prescriptiveness of some of the legislative proposals, which we believe may not ultimately have the intended impact and may even inhibit our efforts toward reform. And let me discuss each of them um, in sequence. Um, beginning with intro 1590, having to do with training for preventive services employees. As Casey recognized, ACS has built a robust network of preventive services and community resources to support families in our child welfare system. ACS's nonprofit providers are among the best in the nation, and I'm proud to partner with them in serving the, the nation's, the city's children and families. We hold our providers to high standards, and we recognize that in order for them to provide the highest quality services, they must be appropriately trained and adequately supported. And as I've, I've explained, the FY18 budget supports that commitment through significant investments to support the preventive services workforce, and specifically, by providing the necessary financial supports for our providers to enable staff participation in mandated annual training. Through the ACS Workforce Institute, we're developing a new 12-day curriculum that will train new preventive agency staff. The curriculum will consist of a new two-day course available once a month for all new preventive staff before they take any cases, followed by an additional 10-day course provided every other month, which new staff will complete within two months of hiring. These courses, which also include training on safety and risk, will begin later this month and will be available throughout the year on an ongoing basis. As I mentioned earlier, $2.45 million of new funding will be available directly to preventive agencies so that they can send all of their frontline staff to six days of required training each year. Intro 1590 would require ACS to provide training on identifying and reporting suspected physical abuse and neglect to all preventive services workers before the individual begins to provide services, and would also require ACS to ensure that all individuals providing preventive services attend at least two trainings per year, the content of which ACS would determine. While we're not opposed to this bill in concept, we believe the legislation is, is unnecessary for the following reasons. First of all, New York City, New York State social services law and the regulations issued by the State Office of Children and Family Services already mandate that ACS staff participate in mandated reporter training and set out detailed requirements for the content of that training. And thus, 
the bill may be preempted by state law and regulations. Also, as described above, our fiscal year 2018 budget provides resources for new 12-day onboarding curriculum through our ACS Workforce Institute for new preventive agency staff. And finally, ACS is going beyond the mandate of the bill already and funding our agencies to cover the actual expenses associated with allowing all frontline preventive workers to participate in trainings every year. Turning to intro 1598, uh, this bill would require ACS to provide to all families receiving preventive services an annual survey regarding the family's experiences with each preventive service provider that provided services to them during the preceding calendar year, and to produce for the Council an annual report of aggregate data obtained from the surveys. ACS values assessment of the experiences of our families, and so we're not opposed to surveying families. But again, we do have some concerns about this bill as drafted. First of all, the bill requires ACS directly rather than our providers to send out these surveys. Given that many families' initial involvement with ACS involves child protection, we're concerned that families may perceive notices directly from ACS to be part of an investigation and therefore may be less inclined to participate in a survey. And since many families develop a strong relationship with their preventive agency, we would propose that the survey actually be issued by those agencies. Second of all, there are some significant costs associated with the bill which without funding will create workload issues for ACS and potentially unfunded mandates for us and our preventive services providers. Third, rather than survey every one of the approximately 20,000 20, families that receive preventive services each year, we believe and we would suggest that collecting a statistically valid sample of data from a sample of families would produce results of high quality for a public report with far less expense and burden to families and providers. So given these concerns, what we propose is having preventive services providers conduct the surveys at the time a family concludes its involvement with the provider and that ACS be permitted to collect that data from the providers, representing a statistically significant sample of families rather than every family that receives preventive services. And we're happy to work with the Council to try to refine the legislation. Turning to intro 1601, um, as I've testified previously, one of my first areas of focus after my appointment was to restructure and reinvigorate ChildStat, which is a quality assurance tool for child protective operations. We embrace ChildStat as a vital approach to strengthening our agency's focus on performance accountability around child protection and to building a more unified culture of excellence in practice across the five boroughs. The newly restructured ChildStat model launched last month is the result of extensive review and analysis of previous iterations at ACS, observations of MYPD's CompStat, and incorporation of best practices from other jurisdictions. Our concern about the legislation is that it would lock ACS into a rigid ChildStat model and strip us of the flexibility to modify the quality assurance tool as be best practices emerge and as child welfare practices evolve. We're concerned that the detailed codification of an executive agency's internal quality improvement system and of specific operational and administrative methods and practices extends beyond the scope of, the, of normal legislation. Intro 1601 seeks to legislate every aspect of ACS's child staff sessions from the frequency of the meetings and the staffing of the meetings to the information to be reviewed and the data to be collected. And we have to oppose that approach. We believe that the model just implemented meets the goals of the legislation and the Council's concerns. And we also believe that the Council's ongoing oversight authority would enable you to address any deviations that a future administration might make. So at most, we'd suggest and propose that the Council mandate us to implement a detailed quality improvement program and provide routine updates to the Council to ensure that it is robust and meaningful. Turning to Intro 1607, this legislation would amend Local Law 20 of 2016 to require ACS to report additional data relating to the caseloads of CPS workers and certain child protective procedures including child safety conferences and the removals of children. 
As I discussed earlier, we have accepted Casey's recommendation that we look at alternative measures that better reflect CPS workload rather than simply caseload. And in line with their recommendations, ACS will be conducting a study that will yield metrics to better define caseloads and make corresponding workload changes. We're also in the midst of redesigning our case assignment data system, which will incorporate best practice that are different from those described in the bill. In its current form, this legislation would lock our agency into specific definitions that would prevent us from implementing the knowledge we gain from the workload study, from other jurisdictions, and from our own experience, and that will likely more accurately reflect the specific work conditions of our CPS. Second area of concern is that ACS does not have the technical capacity to report on a substantial amount of the information that the legislation would require. And we would need to work with the Council to devise provisions that better align with ACS's data collection capabilities, with the limits of the statewide system of record that we're required to use, and with the mechanisms by which ACS currently generates automated reports. And third, New York State already prescribes that all local social services districts, including ACS, use a different caseload measure than that envisioned by the bill. And thus, the bill would be inconsistent with that which is mandated by New York State. Intro 1609 would require ACS to produce an annual report on the aggregate findings and recommendations of our agency's Accountability Review Panel, or ARP. Again, we're not opposed to regular reporting on child fatalities, but we would request some flexibility in the reporting structure. We'd also like to work with the Council to devise language that aligns with ACS's capacity to produce reports. We created the Accountability Review Panel for internal quality improvement purposes. And the methodology, the composition, the name, and even the panel membership itself is subject to change over time to accommodate best practices. So we'd propose that the legislation not be specifically linked to the, quote, accountability review panel, but instead focus on the desired outcome, an annual report on child fatalities in New York City that are known to the ACS child welfare system with recommendations for systemic change resulting from those fatalities. We'd also need a longer time frame for producing a report, as 45 days from the end of the year, as the legislation prescribes, is not a sufficient time frame to obtain all the information that we need for the report, especially pertaining to fatalities that occur at the end of the year. For example, information that comes from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner is essential to producing a report on fatalities but the medical examiner's office frequently takes many months or even longer to finalize its reviews. So in order to ensure that OCME reports for fatalities are received in time for inclusion in an annual report, we propose extending the time frame for producing the report to 18 months from the end of the year. Before I close my testimony, I want to share a development, which I know is not relevant to the legislation under discussion, uh, but a development about foster care that I know is of importance to the Council and especially to this committee. The Interagency Foster Care Task Force, established by the City Council and signed into law by the Mayor last fall, will be meeting for the first time later this month. The task force comprises myself, Speaker, Speaker Mark Viverito, Chair Levin, Public Advocate James, five city agencies, HRA, DOE, DYCD Health, and NYCHA, along with representatives from the parent committee, community, advocates and providers, and of course, very importantly, young people who are involved in the foster care system. As you know, the goal of the task force is to develop recommendations to improve services for youth in foster care and to promote better outcomes for young people aging out of care. The task force is charged with making recommendations on a wide, wide, wide range of domains, including education, housing, mental health, and employment. We thank the Council for appointing members, and I look forward to working with you, Chair Levin, and the group to further our commitment to our young people and to develop a new schedule for completing the task force's work. So as I mark 100 days at ACS, I'd like to thank the Council for your support and your partnership as we work to promote safety, stability, and well-being for children and families across the city. And just as importantly, I thank you for your advocacy on behalf of ACS's frontline staff 
and our nonprofit provider staff. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Council's proposed legislation and the work that's currently underway at ACS that addresses the needs that these bills aim to meet. We look forward to working with you to refine the legislation so it can best serve the interests of our children and our families and the dedicated workforce who serve them. And we're happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, Commissioner. So I, I'm going to um, uh, go to my colleagues first because I want to kind of go in depth onto the mm -hmm. uh, Casey report. And so um, in the interest of, of making sure that uh, my colleagues have an opportunity to ask questions, I will uh, turn to them first. And so I'm going to turn to uh, my colleague Debbie Rose who has a comments on her uh, or statement on her, her legislation and, and questions. And question? Okay. Thank you so much, Chair Levin. Um, good afternoon. Uh, we are all here today to hear testimony on many bills related to ACS, including Intro 1607, which is a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the administration for children's services to report more information regarding the caseloads of its frontline workers and child safety conferences because I do think it's time for a change. This legislation will help us identify new ways to better assist our city's most vulnerable children. The new data collected will be disaggregated by zone and office, included, including borough offices, emergency children's services, child advocacy centers, and the Office of Special Investigation. Knowing the experience level of caseworkers broken down by years of experience will allow the agency to identify whether there is a correlation between the years of experience, caseload amounts, and the outcomes of active investigation. In addition, this bill will help the council, advocates, and the members of the public better understand the number of workers in ACS Family Services Unit responsible for directly monitoring children in their homes. The average and median number of cases per worker in ACS's Family Services Unit and whether ACS conducted an emergency removal of a child or children, and if ACS conducted an emergency removal of the child or children, and whether such emergency removal took place before or after the child safety conference. If an ACS worker is being overburdened by caseloads of 12 or more with one year experience as a frontline worker, are we really helping these children? This is an opportunity to fix a system that many perceive as broken. This is an opportunity to identify what is needed in order to support our frontline workers who are overworked and stressed often as they go out every day making sure that these children are safe and taken care of. I want to thank Chair Levine, uh, Levin, sorry, Levin for scheduling this important hearing and thank the committee staff for their work on behalf of this bill and others being held, heard today, in particular Andrea Vasquez, and thanks again to Chair Levin. And I look forward to this testimony. And upon hearing your testimony, um, uh, you referred to the case, uh, to the study, and that um, you were looking to yield metrics that would better define caseloads and make corresponding workload changes. But um, you said in redesigning your case assignment data system, um, which will also incorporate best practices, um, they are different from uh, the metrics that we described in um, intro one, uh, 1607. So um, you said that that legislation would lock the agency into specific definitions that would prevent us from implementing the knowledge we gain from the workload study. Could you please like elucidate um, what those differences are and how um, you know the use of different met uh, metrics would prevent you from utilizing the knowledge that you got from the workload mm -hmm. study? Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. Let me begin, uh, Councilmember, by, by um, thanking you for raising this issue, um, which is a very important one for me as well, um, and for us as an organization. I, uh, you know, I've talked in, in previous testimony about the substantial amount of time that I've already spent in my first three months um, out in the field meeting with frontline workers. I met with hundreds of them in actually 
uh, well, at this point, four of the five boroughs I haven't yet met in Manhattan, but in the other, the other four boroughs, and tomorrow I'm going back out to, to Brooklyn to meet with uh, frontline CPS workers. Um, and, and I've heard uh, in every, every interaction I've had <clears throat> the concerns um, which you have raised about um, the, um, the burden that they're carrying uh, because of the number of cases that they have to handle, the families they work with, the complexity of those families. So the issue you're raising is one of great concern to us. Um, and I, I certainly um, want to endorse that and, and let you know that I appreciate your, your raising it. The concerns we have about the way the legislation is drafted are, uh, are a couple. One is, um, first of all, just based on existing caseload measures, um, we are bound by a measure that the state uses, which defines caseload differently than, uh, than we would for the, the caseload limit of 12 that's, uh, that's uh, embodied in the legislation. So we would be in a situation where we'd be accountable both to the state for measuring caseload in one way and to the city for measuring caseload in a different way. But the, the more fundamental problem, which you alluded to, is that um, as we embark on the, on the workload study, which we haven't begun yet, um, it was just funded last week in the budget, so we're just getting that process underway. But what we know and what I've heard from staff that I've met with in every, uh, every borough office is that the problem with a caseload measure is that a case is not a case is not a case. Cases vary tremendously in, in terms of the complexity of the families, um, in terms of the number of issues that families um, are, are grappling with and the number of services that they may need, in terms of the amount of court involvement that CPS workers may be um, called to participate in, in terms of the travel distances. Um, so caseload alone doesn't necessarily reflect the workload that CPS workers are actually experiencing, and that's one of their concerns and frustrations. So what we intend to look at in this caseload, in the workload study is, is there a better measure? Can we identify a better measure that more accurately reflects the kind of workload that CPS workers are actually carrying rather than just a uh, statistical caseload measure? We don't know that yet because we haven't started the study, um, but that's what we hope to find out. And we'll certainly share with the committee and with the council the results of that. And based on that, we may want to have some conversations about looking at workload in a different way. So I, I agree. I think workload and caseload are, are, very, you know, are very different and, and that it should be looked at holistically as, um, in terms of workload um, and that there are varying degrees. So um, when, when you do your study, would you look at some of the metrics that this particular intro um, also introduced? As, as something that should be investigated and, and part of that study. And when you do the study, are you gonna look at um, the differences in terms of zones that, you know, there are different um, caseloads, different zones like zone A in Manhattan where the average caseload might be 17 as opposed to maybe in, I'm not sure, Staten Island which is a different zone, the caseload might be different. Are you going to um, look, in, look at that also, that different zones have different caseloads? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, those are, are fundamental things we'll be looking at in, in the study. Um, we want to look at um, how we need to align our staffing patterns um, to the actual you know, workload demands of the types of cases that families are handling. We will absolutely look at the different distribution in the kinds of cases that we're seeing um, from borough to borough or even from zone to zone or even from community district to community district and make sure that we're allocating workload proportionally to the actual burden that's being presented by uh, the, the investigations and the families that we're serving. So the, the, the items you mentioned, some of which, as you say, are reflected in the, in the intro legislation, are exactly the kinds of things we'll be looking at in the workload study. And, and will you look into um, why some zones are higher than others, the, the number of cases that are being um, reported and in, into the workload? And do you have a sense of uh, when this study would be completed? And, um, and I'm sure you'll share us, share the results with us, right? We will certainly share the results with you. Uh, I don't know a time frame yet because we, as I said, we just got the funding approved last week. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we're now going to develop an RFP. We'll have to bring a, uh, a vendor on board to do the work for us. Um, 
and it, it's, it will be a substantial piece of work, so there will be some period of time. Um, but we'll certainly share the results with you, and I'm sure we can share interim reports along the way with you as well. Um, and to your first question, absolutely, we're going to be looking at um, variation and differential caseload levels in different parts of the city. And, um, and my last question, um, not only will you look at the caseload or workload, but um, will you also look at the other administrative work that they, that they also have to do? Um, because I really believe that they are overburdened and that we need to, again, take a holistic look at, at this. And I, I want this study to be totally comprehensive. Yes, that's, that's actually a great point. So we will, we will be um, in really two different ways. One is we want to make sure that the things that CPS workers have to do are reflected in the workload analysis. So right. we're really capturing the full, um, the full requirements of handling a case. Um, but the other thing that we're already looking at is whether there are some things that CPS workers are currently being asked to do that we might actually be able to have other levels of staff do so that CPS workers could be freed up to do the things that are most important for them. And that we're going to work on independent of the case of the workload study. Um, and we're actually, um, as a result of, of some uh, investment we got in the budget, we're going to begin a pilot to look at that effort immediately. Great. And I just want to thank you for making mental health services, EPA, available to, um, to the CPS workers um, in light of the stressful situations that they often find themselves in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rose. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, again. Uh, Commissioner, welcome. Thank you for your testimony. I'm just going to focus on, on my bill, uh, intro 1590. I know uh, the chair has a lot of questions regarding all the other ones, uh, so I'll, I'll be as, as quick as possible here. Regarding your 12-day uh, onboarding training curriculum, uh, when will these trainings begin, or have they begun already, or...? I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Commissioner White to speak to that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we, we, are, we already have a number of courses available to the providers, as do some of the providers have courses available to one another as well. And, and we are developing new courses. The, 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 man, the um, onboarding training, we are just now developing the curriculum specifically for that. And that's going to be two days before they take any cases. Some of this comes directly from your own um, comments at a past hearing, as I recall, about your own experience. Thank you. Um, the the um, 10 days will be, so the two days will be available every month to providers. Whenever they have new staff coming on, they'll be able to send people to that, that training. And then the 10 days within two months, they'll, they'll be expected to take that. So, so if I hear you right, uh, we'll be fully operational literally from here on. No, I mean, to get the 12-day piece in place, we still have to develop the curriculum with CUNY. I mean, there are pieces of it that exist. It's a matter of structuring it and structuring it and making sure the right things are in that two-day initial safety and risk mandated reporting, et cetera. The really critical things are going to be in the two-day session. And, I and, expect, oh, sorry, I mean, it will certainly be in place during this fiscal year. And this is mandated, right? Yes. And. Uh, what about for people who already been working and they want to take those courses? Is it available and also is it mandated for them as well? Yeah, so we already have courses available to the preventive providers now, and many of the providers take advantage of those. What we're changing is it's going to be mandated that, that frontline staff at preventive agencies take six days of training every year of their career in that field. And they um, will get funding from us f to cover that time so that they can put coverage on the cases that, are being, that those workers are handling so they can go to training. Let me just add to that. Yeah, one of the first things I heard in, in my meetings with preventive providers is that they very much wanted to send their caseworkers to training, um, but they felt like they couldn't do it because they were in a position financially to you know, backfill those positions while they were out of you know out of the field doing training kind of work. So that's why we've done exactly what uh, Deputy Commissioner White said, which is um, make the training a mandate, but fund it so that it's something that they can af they can afford to do. And we've given them options to have that training done either through our Workforce Institute 
or other resources they may have as long as it meets the mandate of the required courses. Well, Commissioner, I want to, and, and your staff, I want to commend you uh, for taking uh, the, the points that I was making in, in the last hearing, having gone through mm -hmm. the experience that I went through in preventive services. Uh, Commissioner, uh, would you uh, consider, because in my bill we're talking about two days and you took it to the exponential level here, uh, <laughs> which is great. Would you consider, uh, you know, I'm very open to, uh, you know, modifying our bill. I would love to get it codified. And the reason why is because, you know, leadership changes, you know, uh, four years from now, you know, I, I, I know I won't be here, I don't know, in, uh, you know, regarding who's going to be the commissioner. And I will really would like uh, for this to be, uh, you know, protected, what you're doing. Would you be open to that? I'm very flexible as to days, I, you know, I, that was just, I put those two days in there as, as a point of consideration, and uh, by no means I wanted to be rigid about it, but I think 12 days is amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, first of all, Councilmember, I should say, I think, I think you raised this issue with me in our first meeting three months yes. ago, um, and it registered, so uh, I appreciated you. your having put that issue on my, uh, my, my radar screen. And, um, you know, as I said, we're not, we're not opposed to this in concept, we just want to make sure that it is flexible enough so that as we um, decide, as I'm sure we will need to, to adapt the training to future needs, future developments and best practice and so on, we're not restricted by legislative requirements. So we're happy to work with you and the staff to see if we can come up with a way to do it. That'd be great. I'm very open to that and talk, you know, uh, just construct language that be helpful. I don't want to be hurtful, but helpful to, to achieve your goal in your end, which at the end is protecting children. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ch Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. Is it still morning? No, it's afternoon. I was here on time. I hate when these things go late. Uh, I first want to thank you, Commissioner. I think this is our third meeting, and I want to thank you uh, for your enthusiasm. I've been very impressed uh, at the several hearings we've had with your appreciation of the issues at hand and your desire to address them uh, quickly. So I want to thank you publicly for that. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm learning, I'm still learning, uh, obviously hope to keep learning until the day I am no longer able to learn. But um, one of the things that I have been trying to figure out is how much training uh, takes place for a new employee. If I uh, was a brand new, uh, protective services worker starting today, what happens on my face today? Can you mm -hmm. take me through that quickly? Uh, let me make a couple of comments, and then I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner okay. White, who Somebody. oversees that program right. and can tell you much more, in much more detail than I can. Um, but the, the short answer is extensive training. <clears throat> we realize that the work that CPS uh, workers do is um, very complex, um, and it's important uh, not to send them into the field without um, adequate training to make sure that they can do it well and protect children and families well. Um, so um, it's really a, a, about a six-month training process before they're fully uh, out in the field. And even then, um, there's continued training, and there will be more um, as we extend our coaching into the field offices. Um, and I, I had the experience a few weeks ago, the opportunity to meet with several cohorts of trainees in our training academy, <coughs> two groups that were in their first week of training and one group that was in their seventh week of training. And so I had the opportunity to talk to them, to hear from them about what the training experience was like, um, how they felt like they were being prepared. Um, the seven-week group had a, had a first opportunity to do some on-the-job training in the field and had come back into the training academy. Uh, so I got to hear what that was like. So it gave me a much greater appreciation um, for how, uh, how well-developed our training curriculum is um, and how much difference it makes to the quality of work that CPS are able to do. Um, let me ask Deputy Commissioner White to talk a little more detail about the six-month process. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, the, the, the way it works now is when a worker is hired, they go straight into the academy. It's an eight-week experience in, the, in James Satterwhite Academy. Um, within that eight weeks, they go out to the field offices around the city for short periods of, of their initial experience on the job. But in that eight weeks, they are learning 
the basics. It's really a boot camp. It's the core training of safety and risk, of investigative practice, of um, family engagement, interviewing, working with collaterals, um, how, to out, how to assign families to services, and most, you know, there's a huge challenge around how to do court work, how to do documentation. All There's a lot to learn in this business. Sure there is. So they spend that eight weeks doing that. And then they have three months in the field in a training unit. There, they are actually beginning to ta take on cases. They have supervisors who are working closely with them. They're ramping up their, their um, caseload over time. And they're getting support that um, later they won't necessarily have. Um, once they are done with that five to six months of the initial experience, they're ready to take a caseload. That's the way the model works now. What we're changing, I think, and strengthening is making sure that once they are in the field offices, in those training units, there's a real alignment with what they learned in the academy. They have access to mentors, and they have um, training staff locally in their field office that can help them get access to the right kinds of supports they need. And also it gives us an opportunity to have training staff actually assessing the trainees and the rookies in their first year on the job. And how, what's, what's the minimal educational requirement? You need to have a BA or? BA. Okay. And um, do they receive training on, I've gone over this um, at past hearings, uh, concerned about the safety, obviously, of, of the employees, but certainly of the families that, that you're involved with. Do they have training when they should engage the NYPD? And um, you can take me through that in maybe a minute. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher is probably better placed to talk about that. Right. Got it, sorry. That training is ongoing. Um, so first, as um, Deputy Commissioner um, White explained, part of their core training also involves meeting with our investigative consultants um, and, and meeting with the investigative consultants who were former um, detectives with the NYPD. Um, they talk about first, how do you safeguard yourself in the field? Um, and then while you're out there and you're making your assessment, um, how do you ensure that children are safe? Um, as it relates to their physical safety. Um, so then throughout their training experience, um, they go over the policies and procedures as it relates to our instant response, um, you know, responses to, to um, cases that where, for example, um, physical or sexual abuse are, are the allegations. Um, that happens throughout their training experience. And, and as they progress through their, their, that 90 day training, um, they also get a case that was flagged as an IRT so they can have that experience in tandem with a, a, an experienced training supervisor to walk them through those steps. Right. Okay. And it's a, to add to that, I mean, it, there, there's, it, there's a lot of very clear communication to frontline staff about when it is appropriate to work with police, and, and it's pretty broad. I mean, they have the, um, the right and the ability to, to reach out to police whenever they think they need help, okay. not only on IRTs, it's not only on special cases. Okay. And um, <clears throat> my last question, I know the, the chair has a, more questions for you. Um, in your testimony on page three, Commissioner, you said you've expanded your collaboration, our collaboration with the NYPD in multiple ways. Can you give me just a couple of examples? Sure. Um, first, we consulted with them around the revamped child step model. Um, Chief of Detectives Boyce actually uh, met with us, came to the first session, gave us uh, advice about uh, a aspects of ComStat that we might want to incorporate into ChildStat. Um, so that's one. Um, we have, uh, and we continue to, but you know, again, even in the last few months, we have continued to strengthen some of the mechanisms that Deputy Commissioner Fletcher just described, where we work with the NYPD in an institutionalized way. So our instant response teams where we do investigations with NYPD because they're allegations of, of child abuse or sexual abuse, we've strengthened those protocols. Um, we have strengthened the involvement of NYPD in our child advocacy centers um, where again we investigate you know, potentially serious allegations of, of harm to children um, and uh, NYPD is, is ramping up their presence in those CACs. 
um, and is more actively engaged in them. Um, we're working with, we've talked about this a little bit in the last couple of hearings, and I know it's something that's actually um, uh, been of great interest to uh, the union that represents our uh, CPS uh, frontline workers, um, and that is working with the NYPD's neighborhood coordination officers so, uh, and building relationships between our CPS and the NCOs in their community so they have a connection to NYPD officers on the beat that they can actually develop an ongoing relationship with. Um, so there, there, there are many other, I'm getting notes about it. even just other ones. There's so many ways in which. See that? Um, we're, oh, yes, and the, yes, this is important too. Happening as we speak. Something, right, it is actually happening as we speak. Um, we are, uh, and we're very excited about this, um, we're moving into uh, a cross-training program with NYPD where they are creating some seats in some of their trainings for our staff, and we'll be creating some seats in some of our trainings for their staff to help um, each organization and the staff better understand the, the working realities and the structure within which the other organization has to work. Um, and we are constantly looking for ways to expand that collaboration. Last question, it's a quick yes or no. I heard anecdotally um, that placements in foster care have been up, I would say, since the beginning of the year. Is that true, not true? Not, not, not true. true, not true. Our, uh, our foster care census has been declining for some years now um, and has continued to decline. All right, thank you very much. I look forward to the day when we don't need an ACS commissioner in this city. <laughs> but until then, I want to thank you and your staff for your hard work, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Grudenchik. We've also been joined by Councilmember Richie Torres of the Bronx. Um, so, Commissioner, so I, I think what, what I'd like to do is, um, uh, in mm -hmm. going through the Casey report, go over, there, there you know, it, it, for one thing, it's, it's available online, right? So it is. See it. So I recommend anybody that's interested to go online, and it's a very comprehensive document. How, how often does ACS engage in this level of a, a quality review report? We have an ongoing re working relationship with Casey, um, mm -hmm. and they've helped us in many different ways over the years. Um, it's rare that we do something or we commission a report of this depth. Um, and um, I mean, I was, I was pleased that when I arrived, uh, I learned that the work was underway and felt like there was a great opportunity for me to leverage it as part of my management review because it was so substantial, because it incorporated so many, you know, they did, um, they did an, uh, both the comparison between our work and that of other jurisdictions, which mm -hmm. was very helpful, sort of an aggregate databasis. Um, they did through uh, um, uh, Eckerd Kids, sort of a, a, an organization they work with, they did the uh, review of a set of cases, which was very helpful, and then they looked at all of our policies, procedures, and practices. So it was an extremely in-depth review. Right, so this, is a, a, this could be a blueprint that ACS as an agency could use that's, uh, you know, that's, that's valid for, for a, a few years, is that right? Like a good blueprint for, at least operationally for a few years? It certainly could be. I mean, it's certainly some, we're going to use it, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis in real time to assess uh -huh. progress, but I think, yes, absolutely could be a blueprint for us uh, going into the future. Okay. Um, so it has, um, it has, as you said, an, an analysis of, of policies and procedures, individual case review, and then findings and observations, and then recommendations. Um, in the findings and observations, which is a, a large portion of the report, um, there are uh, there identified uh, areas of strength. Uh, this is broken down into mm -hmm. different policy areas, the areas of strength and uh, areas of opportunity. And um, being that we're, you know, the oversight body, we'll, we're not going to focus necessarily in the areas of strength, but I want to acknowledge that they are there. Um, <laughs> uh, but instead, focus on the areas of opportunity so we could talk through those. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as you said in, in your testimony, you've, you are ad uh, agreeing with uh, and adopting all the recommendations uh, laid out at the end of the report. So, um, so we, w we won't necessarily, uh, we might touch on a couple of those, but I'd like to kind of maybe uh, go through the areas of opportunity. Um, so if you have the report in front of you, starting around page, um, page 17 or 18 mm -hmm. and then going through there. Um, uh, so, uh, the first one I'd like to uh, uh, talk about uh, on page on page 17, it talks about, and this is actually in an area of strength, um, uh, that um, 
there are subject matter experts um, that are with uh, clinical consultants in substance abuse, mental health. This is on the, on the last paragraph of the page of 17. Reviewers noted that ACS has subject matter experts, clinical consultants in substance abuse, mental health, and domestic violence who can consult on cases with relevant family history. However, this resource was not used in all cases. Had this occurred, the score could have been moved even higher. In focus groups, there was agreement. There was a mismatch between the availability of subject matter experts and the volume of cases that needed consultation. Uh, it was reported that long-term vacancies among the clinical consultant staff in some offices had contributed to the delay. Can you speak a little bit to that? What's the structure of these clinical consultants? Are they, are they uh, outside consultants? Are they ACS employees? Um, is there, uh, is there a gap in, uh, is there, uh, you know, are there vacancies? And is there a gap in terms of where they are and where they're needed? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll say a couple things and then turn over to Deputy Commissioner Fletcher to talk a little more about it. Um, but the first thing is I'm glad you acknowledged it and it's something we're very proud of because I think it is something, uh, an area in which um, ACS is, is distinguished um, uh, as a child welfare organization and we're, we're very proud of the fact that we have this structure. Um, and uh, what, you know, and I've certainly observed this when I've visited field offices, they are consulted with extensively by CPS uh, on cases. Um, they are people with specialized expertise, um, and so it's not always easy for us to uh, recruit exactly the people that have the kind of expertise that we need. Um, and this actually goes to the dialogue we were having a little bit earlier uh, about variations in caseload across the boroughs. We um, assign our clinical consultants to certain offices, um, but we often see caseload shifts over time, or, or shifts even in the kinds of cases that we're seeing over time from one part of the city to another. Um, and then it takes some time to adjust our resources to make sure that it's um, you know, consistent with um, the caseload demands. So this is, uh, that process, that exercise of making sure we're, we're matching our clinical consultant capacity with the consultation need at a given time in a given office is a constant challenge and it's one that we're looking at uh, you know, better ways of doing. Um, and we're con continuing to try to um, expedite our recruitment to make sure that we can have, fill all the positions. Um, and uh, also to make sure that we um, are, are appropriately allocating those services to others. Um, we are um, expanding the program actively. In fact, we've just recently uh, re RFP'd the program to try to uh, double it in size. So we'll be bringing on more clinical consultants over time because we recognize how valuable the service is um, and the fact that in order for CPS workers to do their investigative work on a timely basis, they have to have timely access to consultants in cases where they need them. Um, but Deputy yeah. Commissioner Messer may want to yeah, just uh, to add, on that. Just to add to what the Commission is saying, so our clinical consultants, our experts, um, are um, contracts. They don't work directly for ACS, um, so they work mm -hmm. for our numerous um, community-based organizations. Um, but there, as the Commissioner mentioned, that they are, you know, with the uptick of intakes that we've been experiencing in the Division of Child Protection, um, of course, they are the ones who do our consults on these very critical cases. And we also realize that CPS child protective specialists bringing these cases to our clinical consultants um, provides you know, a fruitful assessment of our children. So there are times that- um, Sir, Can you, you know, speak a little bit closer to the mic? Sure, I'm sorry. Just because we're, we're recorded and yeah, make sure sorry. that everything's- Yeah, so it provides a fruitful assessment for our child protective specialists as they assess safety. Um, so there are times, um, based on the demand, it has been a challenge, and as the Commissioner noted, um, we are now um, RPing to increase the number of clinical consultants who will be able to service the needs of our child protective specialists in our borough offices. But they are co-located in the borough offices. They're assigned to specific borough offices. We want each borough office to have each discipline so that CPS are able to access um, these disciplines as they need. And, and you're able to ascertain in, in real time where the need is based on feedback from your borough offices or based on data where, you know, the, the, your case review where, um, where it's taking place and where it's not taking place and that type of thing? Yeah, so most definitely. Our clinical consultation program, they report out on a monthly basis to the borough leadership mm -hmm. how many consults that they convene, the consults, how long it takes for a consult to occur, 
and then how long it takes for them to report out on the consultation. Okay. Um, I was just going to say this is one of our central analytic projects underway now is how to make sure the <laughs> right cases, the, the most high, high service need cases are assigned for clinical consult as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, moving ahead to, uh, to page 20, the area of opportunity with policy review and communication. Uh, it says a common, coordinated, and efficient method is needed for communicating new and updated policy to all staff, including both ACS and provider agency staff. In particular, Casey found protective and provider staff experience communication of policy differently with varying satisfaction. Um, an improved central repository for policy documents for provider and protective staff is needed. The current online system is poorly indexed, not user friendly, and would benefit from review to ensure that the most updated versions of policy are available and that the DCP manual is a central document providing guidance for ACS safety practice and child protection. Although electronic links to policy embedded in the manual appear to be updated regularly, comprehensive review is needed on how effectively the structure and contents of this document as a whole are serving their intended purposes. So a lot of this seems to be around um, um, the, the uh, user interface uh, with, um, you know, technology and, and how the manual is, is getting to uh, CPS and preventive staff and how, it's, and how they're interfacing with it. So. Yeah, it's, uh, and again, I'll, I can start off and, and Deputy Commissioner White can talk in way more detail than I can about this, but mm -hmm. um, it is, it's a few things. It's how the organization, how it's organized to begin with, um, because what tends to happen with policy is it's an accretion, right? You know, new issues come up, new findings come up, new recommendations, we issue new policies, but every time you issue a new policy, you don't necessarily think about how to really make it fit well within the existing structure. Um, and so the organization of that, uh, of our case practice guide, as we call it, um, is something that, uh, that we're looking at and we actually hope to, to reorganize it and kind of rationalize it um, over the coming months. So part of it is the organizational structure of the material itself. And then uh, second is how we communicate that to our frontline staff um, and in a way that makes it really um, accessible and usable by them. Um, again, one of the things I've heard when I've been out in the borough offices is uh, a frustration from CPS workers that sometimes the way they learn about new policies is they get an email that says, here's a new policy, um, but they don't necessarily get the explanation they need about what it means, how to use it, when to use it, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I think looking at how we can better uh, disseminate policy in a way that actually uh, enables CPS to incorporate it into the way that they're doing their work, which is what you want to have happen. Uh, is something that we, we are looking at. And then the third, Chairman, is what you mentioned, which is how do we use technology to make it more accessible? Um, and here I think there's a real exciting interface with the way we're rolling out new technology for staff. Um, so as we roll out tablets um, over the coming months, um, we're going to make it possible for staff to access this um, th on the tablet. So um, they won't, you know, won't be paper, you know, posted on your your uh, cubicle anymore, you'll actually have the ability in your office or in the field um, to access it and we'll make sure that the practice guide is indexed in a way that will make it easier for people to get to the information they need very quickly um, on whatever, uh, whatever tool they're using currently to, to get the information. Yeah, so I would add, um, I mean, first off, in terms of existing policies, one of the things we did. So if you could speak a little closer to Mike. Sorry. One of the things we, in terms of the existing policies, one of the things we did, even as Casey was doing its review, was create a much better indexable system online through SharePoint that our staff now have access to. It's, you know, a thousand times better than what was there even six months ago. That went live last December. But the biggest challenge with all of this is that accretion of 25 years of policy and the duplication and, and some of the contradictions that exist in our policies that we are working through steadily to clean um, and streamline so that workers actually can have a handle on what is required of them, both in terms of policy and in practice. And on the tablet, they will be able to have access, when, when we're done with this, they're going to be able to have access to a ready to use updated case practice manual right there in their hands when they're out in the fields, uh, out in the field. So that is a, that's going to be a dramatic change. The process by which we 
communicate policy, particularly with DCP staff, but also with provider staff, is something we, we're working on very closely across all of the divisions on making sure we are um, devising the most sort of uh, accurate, but also not overly burdensome policies that can be understood quickly and distributed in a in a much more consistent way. I think one of the things other organizations do is do a quarterly distribution of these are the new policies this quarter. And so there's a whole rollout that goes with that training, discussions, et cetera. I think that's, that's one model we're looking at as a possible way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, moving on to the next area of opportunity, which is policy response to critical incidents uh, and this, uh, this section of the report uh, talks about um, you know, more of a cultural shift, I think, in terms of how we are approaching critical incidents. And, um, you know, understandably, um, when, when we see a, a, a critical incident like a child fatality in New York City, um, some uh, become uh, a greater focus of public attention than others. Um, oftentimes, uh, as we've talked about here in this committee, um, critical incidents then drive policy reforms. Sometimes policy reforms will be almost entirely associated with one, with one critical incident, um, one child fatality, um, and, uh, and, and might not necessarily be addressing other um, uh, major shortcomings that might be arising out of uh, gaps in policy. Uh, and, and so this uh, uh, looks at um, shifting away from a blame-based approach. Um, and so that's, you know, that's not, it's, that's a somewhat more amorphous, I believe, right? It's, it's a kind of a cultural shift within the agency. Um, you know, obviously how society at large and how the media approaches um, a critical incidents is outside of your jurisdiction and, and truly outside of, of your control. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, how ACS uh, responds to all of, uh, of those incidents which tragically continue to happen and likely will continue to happen in some form uh, and in some measure. Um, but uh, looking at how, it, it, can you talk a little bit about their recommendation and how you intend to incorporate that? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is an area that I think is extremely important, but also difficult because it creates some, as you're saying, some stresses with um, the ways in which um, society at large and, the, you know, sort of the context that we work in responds to tragedies and also the way that we have to. I mean, it is important that um, we inf enforce um, procedure. Um, and if something, hap something bad happens because procedure wasn't followed, we have to deal with that in, in that situation. Um, but what, what's also important, what we've seen in, in, in other areas, and I think it's equally applicable here, is that you want to create a culture where people feel comfortable coming forward and acknowledging problems um, that require a systemic solution so that you can then focus on them and figure out what it is you need to do as opposed to burying problems under the rug um, which then can lead to really tragic results. You know, we've seen, you know, the, the areas that are often cited are aviation, where, you know, uh, we now have probably safer aviation um, than we've ever had in history, partly for this reason, because there's a, a, a safety culture practice where people are encouraged to come forward and acknowledge problems and not have to worry about being blamed or punished for it. We've seen, seen the same things happen in healthcare. Um, where the culture has, has shifted uh, largely in hospitals away from, you know, don't say anything if there's a problem with hand washing or whatever because you're going to be punished to one that encourages people to come forward with that so it can be corrected. And I think... They speak about near misses. In the near misses, exactly, near misses. So I think we have the same opportunity. Um, I would like to think, and I, I do think, that the way we have retooled our child stat program can be a model for how we do this within ACS because we've tried to create a culture within child stat that is, um, as I like to describe it, rigorous without being punitive. That says we, we need to have honest conversations about what we didn't do right and why and figure out what, what we can do to fix them. Um, but we want to do that in a, in a safe space 
where the staff that are discussing those problems don't feel like it's going to be punitive on them or on their teams. Um, and so far, I feel like the feedback we've gotten um, from the participants in child stat has been that, they, that we've been successful in doing that. Um, but I want to make sure that we continue to focus on that and then I think, you know, figure out how we roll that culture out across the agency um, so that we can, um, we can encourage everyone to focus on uh, how we avoid the near misses and how we get to, uh, you know, better systemic solutions for the problems that we're dealing with. Right. You don't want uh, systemic reforms to be in tension with accountability. People, you know, you, exactly. Um, okay. Um, and this, that's something that, you know, we're, I think we're going to continue to have to um, uh, revisit uh, as um, your tenure continues and as uh, the, the revamped child stat um, you know, moves forward. So perhaps uh, you know, as we uh, uh, reconvene on this issue, uh, either in the fall or early next year, uh, mm -hmm. we should uh, uh, continue to talk about that issue. And if there's um, updates that you'd be able to give at that point, uh, it's something we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, uh, moving ahead to uh, safety and risk ass assessment model and tools. Um, uh, you touched upon this a little bit, I think, but assessment of sa safety and risk um, is, uh, as it says, the, the foundational element of any child welfare agency's practice. Um, ACS pra uh, practice follows the safety and assessment, safety assessment and risk assessment models, modules of uh, the Family Assessment and Service Plan Guide published by OCFS. Um, uh, the tools and guide the tools and guide are comparable to safety and risk assessment tools used in other states. However, both New York City and New York State recognize that the safety and risk assessment models and tools have been in place for more than 25 years, and, and they need to take advantage of advancement in this area. And so uh, it's, it's talking about it, um, selecting uh, an updated model, and I think this is talking about the uh, accretion of, of policies over time. Uh, you talk about how you're looking at uh, safety and risk tools uh, that are um, uh, to be best utilized in 2017 uh, instead of uh, methods and tools that date back to, you know, the early 90s uh, when, I mean, it, one thing that in the back of my head as we're preparing for today's hearing is that, you know, uh, technological advancement um, is, an exp is, is exponential. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we are, you know, th the, uh, the, the, the amount of technology that is that is available to an agency like ACS um, is is literally light years ahead of where it was even 10 years ago, and that and that advancement continues to accelerate. And so, you know, how are we incorporating all of that as we're looking at um, uh, safety uh, and uh, um, uh, assessment and tools um, to to better protect New York City's children? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an area where I think, uh, as you're saying, Chairman, there's a lot of potential. Um, we uh, were somewhat hamstrung by the fact that we are obligated to use um, the protocol that the state has prescribed for us, which is the Family Assessment and Services Plan. Um, we're interested in looking at um, new models, uh, as are they. And so we're in dialogue with, with the state and the Office of Children and Family Services on that. Um, but you, ultimately, we're bound by their determination. If you look around the country, can you identify any models that are, um, are, are uh, you know, appealing or, uh, you know, particularly interesting? There are, I mean, there are tools that we've been looking at, in fact, that we are already beginning to plan out how to bring them on, particularly, for example, tools that allow us to to assess more, and these are just straightforward assessment tools that you train your frontline staff in using on how to assess safety in the home. Um, one really interesting one is a tool to help a worker understand better the perspective of the children in the home. Um, it's a, really an interview tool as opposed to a data analytic tool. On the flip side, we've looked a lot at analytic models. We have we will have a lot to talk about down the road on that, and there are some people doing some fascinating work around the country. Um, we are among those doing fascinating work on that, and we'll be talking about it. Yeah, even, even within the context of what the state has prescribed uh, as the guide, which ultimately we'll have to wait until they're ready to 
uh, to change this. There's some exciting things we can do, and I think we're on the cusp of doing them. So we'll look forward to talking with you about them in the near future. But you're always looking for best practices around the country, because just because we're the biggest doesn't necessarily mean that we're the most uh, advanced. Absolutely. Very true. Um, okay, moving along to uh, preventive services, uh, the area of opportunity. You spoke about this uh, a little bit in talking about the bill, but capacity of, of, of uh, contracted service providers. And this is a long-term question of how to make sure that uh, the, the capacity is matching up to, the, to where the need is you know, in an ongoing way. So uh, maybe my only question here is can you, um, because what they, they, they identify where, you know, the, uh, essentially, um, uh, because of perhaps a lack of a slot, um, they're holding over a, a CPS case um, for an extended period of time, um, just waiting for the slot to open up, I think. Um, obviously, that's not, um, that's not what we want to see. Um, so uh, how are we, I guess the, the question is, as we're looking ahead, how are we uh, uh, approaching uh, the issue of uh, a mismatch of capacity to need in specific areas, how that's reported, and then how it's addressed, and how it kind of goes up the chain of command, so that uh, you know Commissioner Hansel isn't saying, "I didn't hear about this." Like mm -hmm. there's been a you know a, 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 a request for an additional capacity in uh, in this one sector, and uh, somehow it never got up to you, to your desk, and you know takes months and months and months. So mm -hmm. how do we streamline that? Sure. Let me say a little bit about that, and then I will turn over to Deputy Commissioner Martin to, to talk in, in more detail. But um, this is something we're very, very focused on. Um, uh, we're very concerned about the idea that any family should have to wait for preventive services anywhere in the city. Um, so we are, and, and I will say, you know, Casey's, uh, the analysis that Casey did that this is predicated on, of course, all happened before we knew about the the budget investments. So we're now very well positioned to address, I think, some of their concerns. Um, but uh, we knew, and you know, I certainly became aware very quickly when I started three months ago, that we um, had to uh, both better match capacity to need um, geographically across the city, geographically across the city, and also by uh, the kinds of, of needs the families were presenting in relation to the, the different preventive service models that we have. And so as we've developed a plan to roll out additional slots, um, we thought very carefully about where that need lo is located geographically and where it's located by uh, type of service. Um, and that's been uh, the premise on which we have developed our, um, our program for rolling additional slots out to providers. And let me have Deputy Commissioner Martin talk about that a little bit more. Sure. Uh, I think you've heard about this. Uh, it's, you know, we've shared it in numerous uh, venues. Uh, we intend to actually expand the number of preventive slots that we have in our family treatment and rehabilitation program, which is a very intense uh, driven uh, program built on phases to work with families that present with caretaker substance abuse or mental health. Uh, we also intend to roll out additional slots to serve our general preventive, uh, especially targeting communities where we have less, uh, you know, slots to serve families that, that need that. Uh, I think, you know, we're also looking at, and thanks to investments, we were able to increase the headcount of the staff that actually manage, uh, you know, our referrals and, and matching the, the families with, with services. And I, we're also looking at our, uh, you know, the tool that we have right now that actually uh, is used mostly by the CPS to help them think through what do we have in the system and how can we, uh, you know, identify the services that best uh, meet the family's needs. And so we're doing some work around that also. Yeah, to, to your initial point, Jeremy, that the, the movement of cases between child protection and preventive services is both critical and very complicated. Um, and um, one of the things that I think, I think my team will tell you I've, I've been um, emphasizing since the very beginning is how important it is that we work um, closely horizontally to make sure we're thinking about this as one system, not multiple systems. And so I know that um, uh, Deputy Commissioners Fletcher and Martin are working together to figure out how we can expedite um, the movement of cases from child protection that no longer require 
Child Protective Supervision really need preventive services uh, but may not be able to access them immediately because of capacity concerns, um, how we can better address that through uh, both internal resources um, so that we're better matching families with availability of, of services um, and, and also making sure that we're moving cases through the preventive process in the fastest, safe way we can so we open up opportunities for new families to move from child protection into preventive. And then one other uh, area with preventive services is uh, for families receiving court-ordered supervision. So do, can you talk really quickly about that? Yeah, um, we, we are seeing and have seen over the past number of months an increase in, in families that are, are uh, under court-ordered supervision. Family court is increasingly um, requiring that. And uh, in, so those cases we're required to supervise. Um, that's, that's our mandate. Um, but in, in many, probably most of those cases, uh, preventive services are actually the thing that they most need. So that creates uh, two challenges for us. One is to make sure that we have the preventive services capacity for those families and the, and the needs that they're presenting. And then two, that we are well coordinating our, our uh, supervisory services, usually through the family support unit of child protection under De Deputy Commissioner Fletcher with the preventive provider under Deputy Commissioner Martin and making sure that that uh, collaboration is happening between our staff and the preventive provider in a way that is ensuring that the family's needs are being met and that we're helping the family to achieve its goals um, is, is a critical thing that we're increasingly focused on. Um, okay, moving on to on page 25 and um, in in family engagement. Uh, <laughs> the elevated risk and service termination conferences um, so this is, uh, this is, uh, is necessary for ACS to re-examine the effectiveness of its elevated risk conferences and the newly implemented service termination conferences to determine whether they are achieving their intended goals. I think this was a reform that went into place um, uh, immediately after uh, the Samir Perkins tragedy. That's right. Um, and uh, this involves um, uh, having is that, uh, a, a, a sign off from uh, a CPS caseworker for, for every closing of a, of a preventive case, is that correct? Of high risk cases. High risk cases. Um, and so they're recommending uh, a re-examination of that policy, is that? Uh, yeah, um, the policy was put in place, as you said, uh, it was one of the things that uh, the agency did as a result of the Zamir Perkins fatality um, to ensure that preventive cases uh, in situations that were high risk were not closed prematurely by a preventive provider. Um, that obviously makes sense and is important the unintended consequence that we've seen from that, which Casey is speaking to here, is um, that that has um, made it obviously more difficult for us to close those cases uh, and therefore to open up those slots for new families. And we think that's one of the contributing factors to the wait, wait list that we currently have for preventive services. So what we're looking at is whether we can um, not undo that requirement, but whether we can tweak that requirement in a way that continues to protect the safety issue, um, but also expedites the process of closing those cases. Um, so for example, we're looking at whether we can use data to better identify the, the cases that um, uh, are most important for us to focus on um, and just targeting those cases um, so that we give the preventive providers more latitude to uh, identify cases that can be safely closed so that they can open up slots for new families. Um, okay, then. Moving ahead to multidisciplinary collaboration and coordination, which is this is a, um, a very um, uh, intensive and um, uh, expansive, interesting area uh, of, of where we can, I think, ad advance uh, practice. And you know, they, they talk about the incident response teams, uh, the child advocacy centers. Um, uh, one thing that they recommend is a public health approach to protecting children. Um, and this would include in um, uh, one thing of uh, having triggering automatic referrals for, um, I'm trying to find this here, automatic referrals for um, uh, uh, nurse, Oh, uh, right, automatic referrals, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Considering up implementing a, sh a comprehensive strategy, uh, sorry, ex 
I'm sorry, explore. Um, There's a shoe here. So build on ACS and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene efforts mm -hmm. to further partner to improve child safety by establishing mechanisms for an automatic referral process of infants on CPS caseloads to home visiting programs as is currently being implemented in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Explore linking CPS with public health nurses and responding to infants referred to CPS, a strategy also recommended by the Los Angeles Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, consider implementing a comprehensive strategy for training, engaging, and partnering with the medical community, including related guidelines to follow when a child presents at any clinical setting with traumatic injury that may have been caused by abuse or neglect, as has been done in Connecticut and Ohio. Prioritize uh, enrollment of young children who are involved with preventive or protective services and early care and education programs, and that an effort that is already underway but has not yet been achieved on a system-wide basis. Um, so, uh, if you could kind of address those one by one, um, uh, you know, and then comprehensively how we're partnering with our uh, public health communities and um, and looking at child protective services through a public health lens. Mm -hmm. One thing that um, you know, I uh, I have a, a four month old child, and uh, you know, in in all of one thing that I noticed, and we got great prenatal care, my wife got great prenatal care, uh, <laughs> at, uh, and my child got great prenatal care, at, um, at, at NYU, and it was, you know, they did a, a fantastic job, um, but uh, I always felt like they were missed opportunities at every prenatal visit where we weren't, we weren't being offered, um, uh, you know, uh, further enrichment uh, at those visits. There, you know, there wasn't a you know, an option to stay at for a half, a half an hour longer to receive uh, extra parenting classes. Um, you know, those types of things. Uh, you know, there's obviously there's the um, uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, nurse programs um, uh, that that are available, um, but they're not reaching every child uh, that needs them, and they're you know they're they're somewhat restrictive in terms of. Uh, who can qualify, and they're geographically based, and mm -hmm. so uh, how are you know how are we looking at this? Yeah, issue? I think this is uh, NFP. Er that was the Nurse Family Partnership was the right. <laughs> uh, I think is an area of tremendous potential for us. I'm very excited about it, and actually, um, we've already had some very good dialogue with um, Commissioner Bassett at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene about opportunities. You know, building on our sa safe sleep collaboration, things we're already doing with them, um, some additional areas. Um, they have uh, a range of home visiting models that they are already sponsoring and funding, um, and I think the potential to identify the right points in our engagement with families to trigger um, the uh, either referral to or um, engagement with those home visiting programs is a fantastic opportunity, and I know uh, she's very interested in working with us on that. So that, that dialogue is already underway. So I think there's a lot we can do to connect our families, in addition to the preventive services, which are uh, mostly non-medical, not specifically medical, there's a lot of opportunity to, to also connect our families to more specifically mental, medical health-related services, many of which the city is already supporting and funding. We just need to find the right points of intersection. Um, so that, that dialogue with uh, DOHMH is already underway, and I think, um, I, I hope, and I, I think we're gonna come up with some really productive opportunities immediately. The last bullet, is, is Health and Hospitals Corporation part of that conversation as well? Uh, not that kind, but we're talking with them as well. Yes, um, and there because we already we do have um, you know some engage, engagement with medical providers already in high risk cases through the CACs. So we have a mechanism to build on there, uh, and in many cases we already have backup relationships with H. H and H, I should say now, right? Not HHC. H and H facilities, uh, who are the backup providers for uh, the child advocacy centers. So we've got those relationships to build on there, and there are probably more we can do in terms of utilizing their services as well. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to early childhood, um, one of the things that our new memorandum of understanding with the Department of Homeless Services. Um, focuses on specifically is making sure that our early care and education services are available to um, child welfare and involved families in the shelter system. We want to make sure that they have just the same access that, that other families would have. So mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested also in how we ensure that early care and education services are available 
to the families, because in many cases our families are the ones that are in most need of them, and we want to make sure that they have uh, access as they need them. Uh, and then with, in terms of interagency coordination, they also uh, talk about uh, the children's cabinet as an area of opportunity as well. Um, uh, I know that that's a, 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 uh, any, you know, a, a, an organization that is independent uh, of, it's not within ACS's chain of command, but can you speak a little bit about how uh, we're looking mm -hmm. at evolving the children's cabinet um, to have uh, an, an increased focus on um, on, on, uh, on on child welfare. I know that there's a mm -hmm. subcommittee, um, but I think at the last time we talked about it, they they had uh, met only two times as a subcommittee for the, the on child welfare. And so, uh -huh. um, well, they met twice at least since I've, I've been to two meetings <laughs> in okay. three months. I can say that. Um, and I think the child welfare subcommittee was only formed after the. Um, uh, the fatalities last fall, so it hasn't been in existence as long as the children's cabinet has been. Um, but the, you know, the, the children's cabinet as a whole um, is focusing in a number of areas. It, it is focused on uh, making sure that uh, policies and procedures are aligned across the various city agencies that are members. Um, it's focusing on um, ensuring that uh, we have the mechanisms for data sharing among those agencies, which is always something that sounds simple and turns out to be incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an area that the Children's Cabinet has taken on. Um, and then it has spawned a few very specific initiatives, like the Early Years Collaborative. The Child Welfare Subcommittee, uh, at least in my tenure and the two meetings that I've been to, has been focusing on uh, really the implementation of reforms that require cooperation among multiple agencies. So, for example, the work we're doing with the, with the Department of Education around both uh, reporting of absences but also around uh, school nurse uh, photographing of injuries. Um, the Child Welfare Subcommittee has been kind of overseeing and been a forum for dialogue between the agencies around the implementation of, of initiatives like that. Okay. Uh, sorry, taking one step back, I'm sorry, to the previous question. On uh, the recommendation to build on ACS and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's efforts to further partner by to improve child safety by establishing mechanisms for an automatic referral process for infants on CPS caseloads to, to home visiting programs, is that is that something that we're looking at, um, or is that currently in practice? It's not currently practice. <clears throat> what we're looking at is is what what points in our engagement with the family and the child protective um, a continuum would be the right point to engage that. Um, so, for example, there's there's a new protocol um, at home. I don't I don't know how long it's been in place for a little while at, at homeless services. Uh, that when a child is born to a family in shelter, um, home visiting is provided for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like something we should think about, and we are thinking about whether we want to uh, utilize a protocol like that with, in families that are either under our supervision or under our investigation at a time where there's a newborn. And that home visiting is done under, through which program? Uh, it's through programs contracted by DOHMH. Okay. I don't know specifically which one. NFP or the healthy it's it's not it's not families. fully NFP. It's, and, yeah, it's family. not as comprehensive as NFP. It's much more. It's a three visits. Healthy fam there's healthy families too, right? That's the, yeah. the other one. So it's, yeah. Is it one or the other? We can get you more information okay. on that. Uh, more like and that. NFP has you know very specific protocols about what kind of families can be engaged and for how long and who has to provide well, you have services. To, you have to start engaging prior to the child's birth. That's right. right? So uh, healthy families is 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 a little bit less intensive, but. Um, I'm not sure that either one are being fully, fully utilized uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, d we d uh, in terms of workforce investments. Um, so uh, it does talk about the difference between caseload and workload. And do you want to maybe? Sp I know you talked about it with the uh, uh, with the uh, with uh, Councilmember Rose, but do you want to? Just discuss that that concept of caseload versus workload and how that's how that, that's defining the approach. Um, yeah, currently we use uh, a caseload metric. Uh, actually, the state mandates a caseload metric, um, mm -hmm. under which essentially a case is a case is a case. Um, so regardless of complexity of the family, the needs, um, the services, or the work engagement that's required by the CPS, um, every case counts like every other case, um, and that creates some real disparities in actual true workload. Um, so we want to we want to move to, and it's not going to be easy to do this. And, but the study that we're about to commission will help us to do this. 
to move to a, a measure that more genuinely reflects the actual workload associated with um, handling a case in a family so that we can more equitably allocate that workload across our CPS staff. Um, and then with regard to CPS staff, um, can you talk a little bit about their compensation and mm -hmm. how, um, you know, I, I think one of the big challenges that we have is retaining, as, as is reflected in the MMR, is, re, is retaining CPS staff uh, over uh, the long term and identifying it as a, as a real career for people that enter um, that workforce. Obviously, it's a, a tremendous amount of responsibility, personal responsibility, professional responsibility. Um, people are putting themselves out there. Um, there's a high level of burnout, and as, as, as is clear through the MMR, there's a hard time maintain, uh, maintaining, reta retaining staff mm -hmm. um, past, whether it's a year, 18 months, you know, there's, there seems to be a drop off at a certain mm -hmm. point. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how compensation factors into that and, mm -hmm. um, you know, how we're approaching that? Yeah, um, it's a very important issue and a, a big concern for us. Um, we're losing uh, far too many of our CPS workers far too early. Um, and um, we want to do everything we can to reverse that. Um, and I think reversing it requires a lot of things, some of which I've talked about. Um, we're looking at how we improve working conditions, how we address caseload and make it more reasonable, workloads more reasonable, um, how we use technology to um, make the work more efficient, um, a lot of things we can do. Um, with regard to compensation, um, what we want to do is make sure that our compensation structure is one that obviously is fairly compensating people for the difficulty of the work that they're doing from the beginning, um, from when they first engage with us, um, but also provides an incentive um, for them to stay, um, to upgrade their skills, um, and really to think about this work as, as a career trajectory, and hopefully to think about uh, the potential to move up as they develop more skills and more experience into supervisory and managerial roles. Um, and we want to make sure that we have a compensation structure that encourages people to do that um, so, by, um, you know, uh, motivating them at the right points in their career. How much are they, how much, how much do they, does somebody get paid uh, starting salary as a CPS? About 47, yeah. about, f and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's about 47,000 when they start after they complete training. Oh, we have the, damn it. Great. <laughs> um, after they complete six months of training and are fully in the field, uh, they go up to 51,315. After 18 months uh, in the field, they get an additional increase to uh, 40, I'm sorry, 54,720, and then they plateau there. And unless they are then promoted to supervisor, um, they remain at that level. So that's where it caps out. That's where it caps out at, at 18 months. And not everybody that's a C child protective specialist is, ends up being a supervisor, right? That's right. Some may choose not to. Maybe they prefer the work, um, or they may not, you know, it's just not a direction in which they go. Um, but even if they don't, we certainly hope they'll stay as a CPS worker for as long as they can. And what's the educational, the, the, the kind of standard educational profile of a CPS? Um, a bachelor's degree and a certain number of credits in, in particular fields. So that's, I mean, in 2017, $54,000 is it's hard to make it in New York City. If, if that's the only income in a family, that puts you, I don't know, probably about 60% of AMI, maybe? That's uh, AMI being area median income. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's, if, if, if that's a single, if that's the only income in the family. So that's obviously, it's, it's, that's not, it's not an, I mean, that's what we put as like our standard for like low income affordable housing is 60% is of AMI. Mm -hmm. That's right, and I think, you know, I think it's appropriate to factor in the kind of work that they're doing. Yeah. Um, it's not easy work, it's not nine to five work, it can be dangerous, stressful work. Absolutely. Um, and I think they deserve compensation that reflects that. Yeah, okay, so that's something, you know, as we're, obviously we just passed our, our, our budget uh, this year, but that's something that um, I would like to, um, to, to, to look at, and, and I think that that's something that, uh, you know, really we should be focusing on if we want to be able to retain uh, high quality staff and counter against the extreme level of burnout that uh, somebody gets, um, you know, working this immensely stressful um, uh, type of work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, moving ahead, 
and I promise I'll let you guys go shortly. Um, quality assurance and continuous quality improvement initiatives. Um, uh, area of opportunity, streamline QA, QQ, CQI processes for the division of child protection. Um, the process of retaining and adding QA, CQI procedures has left ACS with a complicated system of overlapping reviews uh, that are overwhelming staff capacity. For example, oversight of cases by managers, good practice obviously, but the cumulative effect of broadening the criteria for such reviews to include reviewing cases at random that may be low risk has resulted in managers reviewing 52 percent of cases. So that's, that's a very important uh, point, is that 52 percent of cases uh, out of the many thousands of cases are, are now getting um, a uh, manager level review. That is an, uh, an immensely difficult question because every time uh, there is a critical incident and uh, the case did not make it up to a managerial review, my first thought is why did a manager not review this case, mm -hmm. right? So that has to do with how you're uh, determining the level of risk in a case. Um, perhaps it also has to do with you know, how the, the volume of cases that managers are reviewing. So that's, this is I think a very, very difficult uh, uh, question to uh, address. Um, I don't necessarily expect that you are going to uh, have a silver bullet answer right now, but how are you approaching that question? Um, I'm gonna ask Deputy Commissioner White to speak to this a little more. I'll just, just say that I think you know, this is another um, another area, you know, where you have the tension that we've talked about a couple times this afternoon, um, and which you just you just mentioned, which is you know uh, flagging a response to an incident uh, in which um, review may not have happened in a way that on the surface seems um, like it would have been ideal. But as you accrete more and more and more of those requirements, you get to the point where you're adding so many burdens that. Um, you begin to um, tilt the system too much towards managerial review and that then crowds out other activities that you might want managers to be involved in. Right, I think so the, just to put uh, in a caveat here, that, you know, I think Mayor de Blasio has made it clear that we will not uh, uh, hold back any resource that is required to make the children of New York City safe. So if, you know, it, it may not necessarily just be a question of adding more managers, right? It's, it, 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 so, you know, in other words, is, is, this a, is, this a, is this a resource question at all, or is it, um, is it really uh, this issue of not necessarily working as uh, smart as we can? I think that's exactly right. Um, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher's team and my team have been working together on this for some time, and um, one of the ways we're going about it is developing a quality assurance team in Division of Child Protection under Associate Commissioner Natalie Marks over there um, that will be uh, very soon starting to take on a, a, re a review process looking at high safety cases, high, uh, we call it the accelerated safety review, but the idea is it will be looking at cases that we've identified as having a high level of safety concern. Those cases will be slotted for that quality assurance process, and that quality assurance process then will be making sure the work has been done on that case and, and that the CPS and supervisor are engaged by the QA team to, um, if, the, if there are gaps in the work, to make sure that work gets done. This will allow the managers, the child protective managers, to actually spend more time managing and less time doing reviews. I mean, it's the kind of thing, that's just one approach that's gonna be smarter use of our resources and a specialized approach to looking at cases that we know we can identify as having a much higher level of risk around sort of immediate safety concerns. Commissioner, I'm sorry that I, I cut you off before I don't through. No, no, no. Um, and, and then in that context, are we, you know, I mean, the, you, you want to be able to have a backstop and a double backstop and a triple backstop. I mean, you want to make sure that there is every, uh, that because, because you have to be 
right, the system has to be right 100% of the time. It can never afford to be wrong. Um, are, as you're looking at that, how, how, do, you, how do you manage that um, concern that there is a, a case that, you know, is, is under that framework not getting the right review? Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a simple answer to that question. Um, but I do think um, that there are ways that we can and that we're actually looking at and hopefully soon we'll be able to, to use technology to help us with that. I think part of it is providing the right information at every level in the supervisory chain to prioritize the families and the cases that need attention when they need it. Um, and I think there are tools that will enable us to, to do that, to create essentially a dashboard so that at the frontline level, at the supervisory level, at the managerial level, um, our staff will have a much better picture of what's on their plate, what, what's in their portfolio, um, what the level of urgency is uh, in each of the, of the cases that they are managing at whatever level, um, where they are in the sort of you know, timeliness requirements in terms of meeting the uh, requirements that we do certain things at certain points in the investigatory process um, and, and will help them more efficiently, much more efficiently and much more rationally manage their caseload. Um, so I think, um, I, I think it's really more a matter of, I, I, I would say, of managing the work better um, than it is. It, this one is not so much a resource issue, at least immediately. Um, you know, you, 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 can't, you don't want to keep adding more and more levels of management. Um, you want to make sure that the managers you already have in the chain can do the job as efficiently as they need to. So if, if you were, and I, I, we have focused on, on, on the case of Zamir Perkins extensively, but if you were to view Zamir's case history through this lens, how would you, what would you have to say about it? <laughs> And I'm not looking again. We don't want. I'm not. I'm not looking to. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying not to right. blame anybody in particular or anything right. like that. But in in terms of structurally through this lens, how would how would you look at? I that? mean, the the benefit of this case is that we put it all out there so we can talk about it a little bit specifically, right? And I think in this case, for example, there was a situation where there was a failure to follow up after the child advocacy center knew about what was going or, or after the Child Advocacy Center had the case. Mm -hmm. That was an opportunity there was a, that we identified in our review last year a very clear gap in that moment after the CAC involvement of the failure of ACS to follow up and others. If we had this quality assurance methodology in place, that case absolutely would have been on the list and would have been because it would have been ID'd at CAC. It would have been ID'd because it was a CAC case, because it was an IRT case, because it had history. Those are, those are the kinds of things that automatically would flag, will flag a case for this process. Uh -huh. Therefore, there would have been a QA review of that case by somebody who had the time to really focus on it and to work with the CPS and the supervisor to go back over it and make sure things were done properly. Okay. That makes sense. Um, okay, and then the final, the final uh, question that I have on an, uh, the area of opportunity identified in the Casey report: <laughs> adopt safety science principles for child protection. Um, so, can you explain what safety science principles are and how that would apply? Yeah, there? I think that's the same issue we talked about a little bit earlier, um, which is about creating a, a culture in which. Um, it's possible to have uh, an open conversation about uh, practice deficiencies that's not punitive, but that encourages people to acknowledge them, bring to the, f to the fore, um, allows us to then identify the, system, the systemic responses that we need to implement to them and get them in place. So it's really, it's really moving from a, a blame culture to a, um, you know, a sort of safe space culture uh, that encourages people to um, acknowledge gaps in practice that we need to address. And that's, and that's because, if, so if somebody comes forward and says, you know, I, I had this case and I didn't, you know, for whatever reason, it just, it was, the, the system wasn't designed to, to, for me to catch this one particular issue or there was a gap here, 
there's, what's the method then for, for somebody like that to come forward, a CPS like that to come forward? Um, well, one of the mechanisms right now is child stat. This is exactly the kind of thing we're doing in child stat is we're, you know, we're, we're doing both case reviews mm -hmm. and we're doing database metrics review and saying, hmm, you know, whatever zone we're, we're talking to that day in child stat, we're saying, you know, your performance here is below the citywide level. Why is that on this particular metric? Uh, maybe your, your investigations are slower or you have more families that are not receiving appropriate services or something. Um, and um, the idea is to engage the managers in that zone in a conversation about the reasons for that. And if the reasons fall within the zone, if there are things that the zone should be doing to improve performance, better training, um, better, you know, if we, or if the issue is there isn't, as we talked about before, adequate available clinical consultants in that zone, and therefore uh, they're waiting too long to have those consultations. That's then. Then once we know that that's the issue, then we can try to address it in in a more systemic way. Um, so child stat. That's why I say child stat. Really, I think is is our initial model for creating that safety science culture, um, mm -hmm. because that's exactly what we're trying to encourage people to do within the child stat context. Um. And then, and child stats now it's it's uh, weekly, weekly. It meets three times uh, a month on a weekly basis. The fourth week of the month is the accountability review panel. So okay. we do every week there is uh, a review process. Three times a month it's child stat, okay. and once a month it's the ARP. And it's randomly selected cases. Randomly selected high risk cases, um, and we're doing it uh, t twice a month. Um, at our headquarters in at 150 William, broadcast out to all the borough offices um, once a month that we're doing it in a borough office um, in a particular zone, which we're actually we're doing tomorrow in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, okay. I appreciate very much uh, your time in answering our questions. Um, we're, obviously, we'll have to continue to engage uh, with you guys and with um, City Legislative Affairs on these pieces of legislation, mm -hmm. um, uh, as they, you know, as we, we, you know, we, we discuss how to best um, uh, codify some of these things into uh, local law, and um, and and how, uh, you know, how to, how we're going to uh, proceed on engagement. Um, on the substance of of, of what we discussed today, um, you know, I look forward to continuing this conversation and for getting your clear-eyed um, uh, assessment of how, um, of how, how the, uh, all of these reforms are going. Um, you know, I ask that you be as self-critical as you are possibly able to, to be, um, because I think that that is, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad that there, um, you, you were able to uh, engage Casey in a constructive fashion um, in a way that is, um, you know, looking, uh, you know, both keeping, you know, both looking back at, um, at areas where, where we've come up short, tragically at times, um, but also looking forward into how we can make the largest system, uh, the largest child welfare system in the world um, uh, more effective, um, more responsive, <coughs> um, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm with the mayor, and I, I know I, I can speak for the speaker on this, that you know, we will uh, spare no expense. Protecting our children is our number one uh, uh, priority in terms of, of the city's budget. There's no greater priority. Um, but um, I want to uh, uh, we want to make sure that we are doing the um, the work in an effective way and and, and uh, in, the, in the best in the best way possible. Looking forward, I'm sorry. There's one more um, one more question that um, uh, that uh, I have here. There um, there are several pending reviews. Um, So, all right, so, so there are there are additional reviews I think that came out of um, uh, the tragedies last fall. Um, so, do you know where um, you know what the schedule is for those? When which one will be next? Um, I'm not sure. State reviews. So the state monitor review, for example, um, 
oh. that you've engaged with through OCF OCFS? Yeah, um, the, the independent monitor, uh, Kroll Associates, we're working with. Um, we've been working with them since March. Um, they have not given us a schedule as to when they expect to uh, produce reports or recommendations, so we don't know when that will be happening specifically. And that's with, that's with the agency that, uh, that you hired with, uh, with OCFS, is that right? We were directed by OCFS to engage Kroll Associates to do the independent monitor work. Okay, but so far we don't have a schedule as to, but are they going to be producing, uh, you know, a, a, a review a, a similar or akin to what Casey did or we do not know? We really don't know. We, I mean, I'm sure they're going to be producing materials, um, but, you know, we don't know exactly what they're going to be. They, I mean, they've been actively engaged with us. They've been doing case reviews. They've been uh, interviewing some of our staff. Um, they've been reviewing our materials. So um, they're actively engaged with us, but we don't know exactly what their plans are for actually issuing um, recommendations or reports. When you find out, uh, you know, what, what action they're going to be taking and when, can you uh, let us know? Certainly. That would be great. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much for your, for your time today. Uh, we, we look forward to working with you, and I uh, hope you have a great summer. Um, and uh, we're going to take a three-minute break, and then we'll hear from uh, members of the public. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay. Um, so, since there are only three people to testify, two on uh, the intros and one on the resolution, I'll just call everybody up in one panel. Uh, Stephanie Gandell, Citizens Committee for Children, Dr. Sophie Charles of Kafka, and Joseph Rosenberg of Catholic Charities uh, Relations Council. Catholic, sorry, Catholic Community Relations Council Director. And I, I think, uh, is it to Towaki um, Kamatsu, if he's still here? I don't believe he's still here. Okay. There you go. And since there's only three of you guys, we'll, we'll put anybody on the clock. <laughs> Take as long as you want. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Steve Levin and members of the City Council General Welfare. My name is Dr. Sophine Charles, and I represent the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, also known as Kafka, and our CEO, Jim Purcell. Kafka represents over 50 New York City child welfare agencies, organizations that provide foster care, child maltreatment, preventive services to many thousands of families. Our members range from large multi-service agencies to small community-based preventive service programs in community districts around the city. We'll be testifying and commenting on four of your proposed amendments to the uh, Administrative Code of New York City. The first that we'll speak to will be uh, number 1590, the Training for Preventive Service Employees. The second will be number 1598, the Preventive Services Surveys. And the third is on child stat meetings. And the fourth will be uh, discussion around the reporting protocol on um, frontline workers and child safety conferences. So let me just say that in beginning with uh, number 1590, uh, preventive training for preventive service employees, we appreciate the council's effort of trying to embed this into the administrative code. Uh, we agree with you that it is incredibly important to have some uh, standards around training new frontline staff. Um, what we do what we are concerned with is the limiting and the onerous and severe limiting of making this an ACS only directive for training frontline staff. And I think we just want to call to your attention that there is a child welfare training network that works very well and is very proficient and successful at training frontline staff. Uh, not just in the provider agency, but also within ACS. So we don't see that ACS uh, currently, that they have the capacity uh, to train all preventive service uh, caseworkers along with their CPS workers and also with the, child, the foster care uh, caseworkers as well. So we just want to make sure that you continue to um, keep a training, an expansive training uh, portal available so that caseworkers can be trained. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, for the past 25 years, Kafka has had a training grant from the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. And through that training grant, we have trained thousands of frontline uh, workers for their beginning casework uh, competencies so that they could uh, include it in that training would be a comprehensive uh, core curriculum on mandated reporters, child uh, safety and assessment, and the bare minimum comprehensive skills to get new frontline staff up and running. So we've been uh, incredibly uh, proficient and successful with doing that. And we just want to make sure that you don't close within your bill the training portals that are already um, online supporting ACS and helping them with, with their uh, staff as well as the, the provider network. And the one other thing that I would say about that is that the mandating of two trainings annually 
is, uh, we believe, overwhelming. It will be overwhelming and very cost intensive for both the provider agencies and ACS. Uh, even with the increased funding for training, uh, it will be uh, still overwhelming for the agencies, ACS and the provider agencies to train every frontline staff for twice a year. So I just want you to consider that as well. And we, we have a very strong supportive training network and we want to make sure that that portal, training portal remains open. Okay. Um, so with respect to the preventive services survey, uh, we just want to say that we thank you for the understanding of knowing that it's important to get feedback from the consumers regarding the quality of services that they receive. And we also want you to know that many of the providers currently uh, engage in customer service surveys and they share those surveys with uh, ACS. And we want to make sure that there is also a collaborative type of survey if there is going to be a survey. We know that CPS is the front door for preventive services and once families come in through preventive, through CPS services, they also work very closely with the provider agencies. So that collaboration should be represented in any surveys if those are to go online. Uh, we do have a concern regarding uh, putting surveys and the results of surveys on the website. Uh, we think that there are some concerns around the validity of the data that's collected. There are some concerns around uh, making sure that agencies are not uh, receiving frivolous or slanderous uh, types of reports. And we just want to make sure that you think about that in advance, but it would also be very costly for ACS to mandate that level of, of uh, customer services throughout the system. So uh, please take into account that the cost. Um, also take a look at what the provider agencies are already uh, submitting in the form of customer service uh, surveys. And with respect to uh, the child stat meetings, we just want to say that we believe and we support what ACS currently uh, has online regarding reviewing cases through the child stat format. And uh, the restrictive and very detailed uh, guidelines that you've outlined in your bill would be, we think, overkill and we'd like you to take a look at what currently exists and to monitor what ACS is currently doing because they, it works and it has been successful and they have also revised and restructured based on lessons learned and we would not want them to throw out the baby with the bathwater in terms of what's already been learned. And they've also already have some um, uh, structures in place to improve what currently exists. So we, we echo what ACS says about uh, wanting, not wanting to have that written into law regarding the structure and what the child stat meetings look like. And moving on to uh, number 1607, there are a number of, of uh, things that we would like to see added uh, into a data collection system. Uh, for example, the number of indicated cases that were referred to provider agencies without ACS contracts for preventive services, we'd like to see some data on that. We'd also like to see some data on the number of indicated cases that were referred to community-based organizations without ACS contracts uh, to receive, for families to receive preventive services there. Most of the ACS referrals to community-based agencies, those referrals go to agencies without a child welfare lens. And so we'd like to see, in terms of repeat maltreatment, what the outcomes are 
and comparing families that go to community-based organizations for preventive services without the ongoing monitoring of how well those families are doing. And we'd like to see uh, some data in terms of the number of, of referrals that go to our providers with the ACS contracts. Um, <clears throat> so we believe that there's a distinct difference in tracking, reporting, and monitoring mechanisms for those two cohorts of referrals. Do you know if ACS uh, uh, tracks those referrals internally? They do track them internally. We just like to have some data, you know, some uh, reports on those regularly. Okay. Um, the other, uh, the last piece around data points that we're interested in is connected to evidence-based services. So three years ago, the city invested in approximately $10 million in evidence-based interventions. And we know that ACS keeps data on uh, the evidence-based programs, but we'd like to have them report out, for example, the number of families with indicated cases that were referred for evidence-based interventions each year We'd like to know about the number of families with unfounded cases that were referred for evidence-based interventions. We'd like to know about the number of families with indicated cases that come back into the child welfare system after having completed an evidence-based uh, intervention. And last but not least, we'd like to know, uh, we'd like to see comparative um, outcomes data on families uh, that have received the evidence-based interventions uh, and comparing those with the families that are receiving the traditional preventive service interventions. So that's some very important data. We've had those interventions for about three years and we'd like to see ACS report out on, on those interventions. Uh, we also think that the data points will go a long way to inform all stakeholders about the uh, effectiveness and the value and the functionality of the various types of preventive models that are in the system. And it's likely that ACS already has this data, so we'd like to see some, some data points on this. And again, thank you for the uh, <clears throat> embellishing the, the ACS budget. We're looking forward to having some, uh, reaping some of the, the benefits in our provider agencies. And I just want to echo one other point that was raised during the ACS testimony, and that is, is that CPS workers, uh, after six months of training, I think their salary is in the $40,000 range, and then at the 18-month mark, they're now in the $50,000 range. Just want to remind you that our frontline provider workers are making about thirty-six or thirty-seven thousand dollars a year. Yes. yes. And uh, we appreciate you listening to our testimony, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions and certainly make ourselves available for follow-up uh, comments. Absolutely, and we haven't forgotten about the disparity in the, the preventive uh, worker salaries. Um, Dr. Charles, just a quick question: When sure. you mentioned the um, data around evidence-based preventive models. Um, do you anecdotally from your provider, member provider agencies, have uh, a sense of, of, of how the effectiveness of evidence-based versus uh, traditional gender preventive slots? Obviously, they're a lot more expensive, a lot more intensive. Are they a lot more effective? So based on the Kafka evidence-based work group feedback and comments, and we meet monthly, they are very pleased and very excited about the outcomes that they're receiving on an individual agency basis, individual agency basis. Mm -hmm. But we're interested in system-wide data. That's okay. the data that we don't currently have at the moment. But they're very excited about it. And the families also are giving great feedback according to the providers. Sounds like a good bill idea to me. Yeah. Okay. We'll put it in. Great. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Gundell. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at Citizens Committee for Children. I'm going to testify both about the child welfare bills um, and in support of the resolution in support of home stability support. Um, I wanted to thank the council and in particular Council Member Levin for holding today's hearing and for your um, attention and interest in child welfare um, and to ensuring that ACS has the resources that it needs to keep children safe and strengthen families. We appreciate all that the new commissioner has done to date um, as well as the um, investments that were in the budget that addressed many of the issues that we've been talking about including training for preventive workers, additional slots, um, and the model contracting process that we hope will be successful for preventive providers. Um, and we are also grateful that child stat has been brought back. Um, and I just wanted to, before getting into the five bills, say I appreciated all of the attention you gave earlier today to the Casey report, to thank Casey and ACS for engaging in that process, um, and for your interest in particular around home visiting and early childhood education referrals. We completely agree with that. Um, and we've also suggested that there might be a way New Jersey has, um, where families who participate in home visiting um, can meet part of the work requirement for public assistance through the hours they spend um, in home visiting programs um, to think about that also um, in your cross-divisional thoughts. Um, but turning to the legislation, we generally support the goals and intent of all five pieces of legislation. We appreciate the need to legislate policies and procedures so that when we have a change in administration, we don't lose a good practice. We think that child stat is a really good example of how um, good practice can be lost when you change administrations. In general, however, we urge the council to work with the agency um, to make sure that the final versions of these bills are not overly prescriptive for ACS, as ACS is going to need to adapt its policies and procedures over time. Um, we agreed with actually many of the suggestions ACS made earlier today. I'll turn briefly to each one individually. On intro 1590 related to training for preventive service workers, as you know, CCC has long supported the need for preventive service. Caseworkers have training. I've testified here many times about our discontent about there being no training. Um, so while we support the training, we're worried that the proposed bill is both overly broad um, and also overly prescriptive. Um, we agree with what has been said earlier that not all of this training need to be provided by ACS um, in terms of what was really described as essentially mandated reporter training. It only referred to physical abuse, but we would, of course, want all types of abuse. Um, and um, we're concerned about what exactly is legislated, and we were wondering if perhaps what could be legislated is really just a requirement that preventive service workers be trained before they start working with family without with, with families without prescribing who provides the training and what exactly the training is. Um, turning to 1598. With regard to the surveys, um, we do appreciate the intent of the legislation. We understand it's important for ACS to know how the consumers of preventive services feel about the programs they are participating in. That said, we're concerned parents may not want to, to, to parents in preventive services are often fearful that ACS could remove their children. Um, they may be very concerned about receiving a survey from ACS, which is also to them the government. They might be worried about their immigration status. Um, the bill would require the survey be administered to every family that had a case in the preceding calendar year. So some of those families would actually have closed cases and may be concerned about receiving something in the mail or however this, whatever format from ACS. Um, and we also are concerned about the cost. Um, we think there might be some alternatives to address the intent of the legislation. Um, to get feedback from families for, so that both ACS and the public have a sense of how preventive services are going, maybe doing a survey sample of those participating in preventive services, or creating a publicized mailbox, both physical and online, where parents could um, anonymously submit comments, concerns, and feedback to ACS about their program, and then require ACS to provide the council with a report on the comments. 
Um, turning to intro 1601 related to child stat, um, we strongly support the intent of the legislation. Um, and similar to the training bill, um, our concern that, again, it's overly prescriptive and doesn't give ACS the chance to change its staffing pattern or exactly what they look at over time and suggest perhaps just legislating that ACS have a child stat type process. Um, on, on 1607, with regard to the um, caseloads versus workloads, um, we think this is really important. Um, and um, based on the testimony of everyone today, I feel it would just be helpful for the council and the agency to come up with what's the best way for ACS to report that type of information, and perhaps it's after the workload study that they discussed. Um, they talked about how they would, of course, share the workload stu study with the council. Um, over time, we've heard those things before, not from this commissioner, but from others, and we don't always get those things. And so um, another option might be to require that they share the workload study publicly. Um, on intro 1609, related to um, the accountability review panel, um, as ACS mentioned, we're also concerned about the timeline. Um, oftentimes, the medical examiner report will not have been received by ACS in time to meet the requirements in the bill. Um, and we also want to make sure that, um, as ACS discussed, that the types of findings and recommendations that they need internally, if reported externally, could stymie staff from wanting to make certain findings and recommendations because they want to work on them internally. Um, perhaps instead ACS could file annual reports on a different time frame that could include some factors about the, the fatalities but wouldn't intrude on their process. So they could, for example, include the number of fatalities of children known to ACS, cause of death, age, gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera, and then a summary of case practice findings and systemic changes made. Um, finally, CCC strongly supports um, Reso 1462 as well as Assemblymember Hevesy's Home Stability Support Program. Um, we are, will advocate anywhere we can for it, including here. Um, we appreciate the assembly member staff being here today. Um, and if there's any way we can be helpful in trying to move um, this legislation through the state legislature, we would um, do so. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, there's another preventive service data bill pending, 1374-2016, um, um, which would provide details about preventive service utilization by program type, and it was addressed in a hearing in December. We just ask that as you negotiate these bills, you also include 1374 because we would love to get that data. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Levin. Um, I'm Joseph Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Catholic Community Relations Council, representing the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn on local legislative and poly policy issues. I'm here today in support of, of your resolution, Reso 1462, which calls for the passage of the Home Stability Support Plan. Homelessness is one of society's most intractable challenges. Many strategies, including legislative reform, financial commitment, and social change are required to confront and resolve this ongoing crisis. Charitable organizations and houses of worship serve an important role in this effort. One of the basic uh, principles of Catholic social teaching is to preserve the dignity of all people. To that end, focusing on the prevention of homelessness and the sheltering of the homeless has been a longstanding priority of the church. Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Brooklyn have embraced the important mission of assisting this population by providing many programs and preserving and developing housing concentrating on this specific need. The significant and timely capital funding commitments from Mayor de Blasio, Governor Cuomo, and the City Council to preserve and develop supportive housing will go far in providing housing for families and individuals at risk of homelessness and for those already in shelters. The right to housing the Right to Council and Housing Court initiative championed by the City Council and the Mayor is also a crucial tool to assist in abating the homeless crisis. But everyone searching for solutions to this challenge knows that more is needed. The Home Stability Support Program is another source of redress. Sponsored by Assemblymember Hevesy, the statewide program would help to prevent the displacement of families and individuals who are eligible for public assistance and are facing eviction from their homes. 
victims of domestic violence facing possible homelessness would also be covered by this program. The Home Stability Support Program would assist this vulnerable population by providing a rental supplement intending to bridge the current and adequately low shelter allowance. It would cover up to 85% of the fair market rent and will replace all existing optional rent supplements. Localities will also have the ability of providing additional subsidies that would help the supplement cover 100% of the fair market rent as determined by HUD. This program is a cost-effective alternative to the placing of families in hotels and homeless shelters. Most importantly, HSS provides a humane approach to confronting and preventing homelessness as opposed to the destructive effort that shelter living can have on families and children. The Home Stability Support Program will help keep these families in their homes. That is why we support the RESO. Thank you for sponsoring it and urge that it be passed. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, I appreciate everybody's testimony here today. Uh, we um, also appreciate, appreciate the ongoing collaboration with your agencies um, to advance a more just and socially equitable uh, city. Um, we all know the important work that we uh, collectively have to do um, to ensure that those New Yorkers that have fallen on hard times or who are especially vulnerable um, uh, have the assistance of uh, the city. We just passed an $85 billion budget. Uh, we, should we should be able to make sure uh, that, uh, that nobody is uh, falling behind or, or falling through the cracks and, and, uh, and that those, you know, all the um, the benefits of the greatest city in the world are available to all of our citizens and, 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 uh, and non-citizens. I, I greatly appreciate uh, your testimony, your patience today, and, uh, and your ongoing collaboration. So, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Any other testimony? Seeing none, at 4.05 p.m., this hearing is adjourned. Sorry, 4.15 p.m. this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>